Yo, great friends. Before we get started on this Friday show, I want to encourage everybody yet again to help the brothers out, okay? When you buy a product from Manscaped and you use our promo code, great friends, you're going to have a really good Manscaped body. So whatever your deal is, because there's some hairy dudes out there, chest, armpits, back, you know who you are, ass. I know a lot of guys, dude, with hairy asses. Seriously. like Ass me- cheeks or... Or, or like down the down the crack? No, like just hairy ass everywhere, like gorilla hairy ass, you know? <laughs> take that Manscaped, dude, take that lawnmower and freaking Manscaped your ass if you have to, okay? Wherever you got a lot of hair and it's gross, Manscaped that shit is all I'm saying. Browner, why are you giving me a look like this, Browner? People how, have hairy asses, dude. How many hairy asses have you seen? See, this is why you shouldn't shower in locker rooms, bro. Hairy yeah. asses? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Dude, That's when I was disgusting. when I was like when I was like 13 and I was in middle school and they used to make us take showers after gym class and I had what? no hair. Yeah, I know. And we had this really weird teacher. His name was Coach George. And when the boys would come out of the the, the shower, he'd make them like jump for the towels. Let me see you jump. Uh, you know? uh, uh, that's some like you need to call the, the authorities on that one, dude. It's, it's <laughs> the uh, boy George. No, he wasn't boy George. He was oh. Coach George. <laughs> oh wow. I uh, thought you were going to just go like a whole different route with the hairy asses instead of actually admitting that you've seen hairy asses in a locker room. I thought you'd be like, you know, there's some porn out there where these yeah. dudes, their butts are super hairy. And, you know, there's some where Manscaped porn stars, they look better. That's what I thought you were going to go with. But doesn't okay. really matter. Bottom line is this. If you got a lot of hair, wherever it may be, manscape your stuff. Guys, I'll say it like this. If you expect a lady to be properly groomed, fellas, you should clean your shit. Manscaped, use our use our promo code. Great friends. By the way, to uh, Ian Rappaport from the NFL Network. See, we can do this shit. Okay, sucks for you, bro. Yeah, dude, you'll you'll be doing this on Twitter. You do it on your podcast, moron. Uh, promo code <laughs> is great friends. Okay, moron. You're great friend with love, buddy. With love, Manscaped. Use our promo code, great friends. Let's start the show. Hey, it's Friday afternoon. Right, yeah. Kaplan and crew, we are in a great mood today. I can already tell you that. Uh, and I'll explain from my own perspective why for me. But it's Friday afternoon. I loves me my Fridays, okay? You ain't got no job. You ain't got nothing to do. So you should be hanging out with us today. Kaplan and crew taking it to the stream, YouTube, Facebook. Oh, Facebook. Finally, yesterday, figured out on my phone how to get back to starting a watch party. And let me tell you something. When you start a watch party on Facebook, your views go from most people are viewing on YouTube, so there are not that many on Facebook, to all of a sudden you start a watch party and my friends are coming from all over the country. High school friends, elementary school friends, guys in New York, guys in Florida, guys in Pittsburgh, guys in Southern California. I'm waving to everybody. I'm high-fiving people on Facebook. So whether you're on YouTube, Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you're listening. And yo, for those of you that are listening in Radio Land on 1090 in Southern California, what is happening on a Friday afternoon? I'm in a great mood today, and here's why. I've got the like uh, the butterflies going in my belly right now about tomorrow and the Iron Man-ish. Really, I think it's fear. But, you know, listen, you you just got to go fearless, right? You got to have no fear of failure. It's been my my philosophy since the first day David Wells told it to me. I went, I'm taking that forever. So, you know what, man? Tomorrow, I'm going to get in the ocean with like 40 other people. I'm hoping that if you're a shark and you're looking at 40 people, you find somebody more appetizing looking than me, very frankly. Oh, are you issuing a plea out to all sharks currently listening to the show and watching I'm asking, YouTube? I'm asking all sharks right now. If you're a shark, okay, and if you're a like, an act, like an actual shark, not Mark Cuban, not NBC shark, uh, no. an actual shark with fins. If you are a great white shark or any kind of shark with teeth, please tomorrow do not be in the La Jolla shores from about seven thirty in the morning till about eight thirty in the morning. After that, I'd prefer that you stay away anyway, so people could enjoy the beach. 
at least during the swim for the Challenge Athletes Foundation Ironmanish. Please stay away. I can't have you near me. Okay. So I'm getting excited now. We're gonna, I'm going to get in the water tomorrow. The first time I've been in the ocean to swim in at least 10 years. I'm going to get in the water with 40 other people. We're going to swim a mile. We're going to get out of the water. We're going to change our gear. We're going to get onto our bikes. We're going to go ride 133 miles, starting in La Jolla Shores, down through Fiesta Island, up north to San Clemente, all the way back up Torrey Pines, back down into the shores, 133 miles. And then we're going to try to run, walk, I say crawl, six miles to the finish line, 140.6 miles, an Ironman-ish to raise more than half a million dollars. It's going to be more than half a mil when we're all done for the Challenge Athletes Foundation here in San Diego and all throughout Southern California. And really it's gone worldwide because of, you know, relationships with, you know, Robin Williams before he died, um, you know, with Will Ferrell. I mean, a lot of celebrity star kind of people who've been really involved. So excited about tomorrow. It's Friday. I actually am loving today's show, but can't wait to get it over with because I got a lot of prep to do for tomorrow. So let me say hola to hermano numero uno. He's representing Ventura, California, Oxnard in the house, the 805. Ladies and gentlemen, hola, hermano numero uno, grande Alejandro in la casa. Que paso? Uh, I just put two and two things. One, I just put two and two together when you said, I know someone that has COVID that's a famous athlete. Just figured that out. Um, also, um, to your right, on the table, that stuff right there, dude, is worth millions. I have not seen Clorox wipes anywhere since February. That stuff right there, what is this new? Is this old? Is this where is this from? Here's what happened. I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't like to lie. A lot of times during the day, I sit here at my computer and my desk that I broadcast from, and here's what I do. Hold on. I do a lot of this. I do a lot of kicking back with my feet. I put my feet up on the desk quite God, a bit, Scott you know, and I noticed today that I had like kind of like gross foot cheese all over my desk. So I said, wait a second, I got these Clorox wipes and I got this foot cheese all over my desk. I'm going to go take these Clorox wipes and clean this thing. And I remembered back in like mid-March when nobody could find these things that you guys were telling me that on the back, it actually tells you that one of the things that these wipes do is it kills coronavirus. And I'm like, how the hell could this say kill coronavirus? I just got these. Coronavirus just showed up last week. But I don't know, that's man. That's not how it works. Coronavirus is a, is a general term. COVID-19 is what we're dealing with right now. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, but I didn't know. Congratulations. You also just made uh, Wicca feet. So congratulations. What's Wicca feet? It's where these gross people that are into feet uh, like there's all these pictures of celebrities and what their feats look like. I'm not uh -huh. calling you a celebrity, but if yeah. you do have a page, you do have one now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, let me say, uh, you said there were two things. You said there was the, the Clorox wipes. Yeah. The other one I, I we don't need to talk about. I, Why just, did I, put, I put two and two together about yeah. athlete, I, I, famous yeah, I just, COVID. I said, I said the other day on the air that I have a friend here in San Diego who is a famous sports celebrity. And he himself uh, had a positive COVID test. Yeah. And I never said the name because I didn't want any. It's none of my, I mean, it's nobody's business. I, right. I don't even know why I said it. It happened to pop out somehow. Which is why when I said it. I didn't, I shouldn't have said it either, but I think I, I know who it is now. But why would you, yeah. what, what's giving that away to you? Um, putting a lot of pieces together. What pieces? I said, uh, I know a famous athlete who's got it. What's, what, what do you know? Then he went down to Rolodex of people in his mind, and, and I was knew like, he picked the most famous one and said it was that one. That's the same thing famous, I did. A famous, a famous one that was that was at a certain super spreader event where a lot of people got it. So now I know who got it. I think. What's the super spreader event? The the uh, White House a nomination of Amy Comey Barrett. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not him. Oh well, good, awesome. It's not him. You you just put two and two together because I said no fear of failure. Yeah. David Wells <laughs> popped into your head. Well, he was at the super spreader event. Wells was there and, yeah. and Trump then got it. And David Wells was not who I was talking about. That's great. And, and Boomer, if you're listening this afternoon or if anybody else is out there listening, let me be very clear. Boomer Wells was not who I was talking about. And I hope that he's healthy and he's safe. Me too. I hope that his family is as well. Way to and, go, Alan. Uh, 
And uh, yeah. Hey, come on. What I, you got... didn't, I, didn't I? Didn't that make sense though? It did. It made a lot didn't of sense. That makes sense. It yeah. did. Scott's I don't know friend, I... famous San Diego athlete who was at a super spreader event. Just makes sense to me. See, yeah. I think it's somebody different, but okay. not blaming the guy or anything. I was just like, oh, now I see why you didn't say it. But hey, yeah. I really do hope David Wells is healthy and the person that has it, the same thing. Yep, me too. All right, let me say good afternoon to this man right here. He's been picking it out, man. He's been picking out this fro because it hasn't really grown over COVID. Like it, not, it hasn't turned into like. Today. Yeah, I saw him in person today too. He actually stopped by my house because today's Beer Friday and he was uh, doing a little run. Ladies and gentlemen, say hello to a man six foot seven inches tall, twisted steel, sex appeal, big sacks, big max, repping the south side of Chicago, bringing the street cred. Ladies and gentlemen, he's known as Big Brown, John Browner, JB, in the mother physique and hizzy on a Friday. Hello, John Browner. What's going on, fellas? What's going on, San Diego? Hello, America. You guys missed our pre-roll recording, and I cannot let this go, okay? You need to tell me more about Coach George. Because what I was going to start with was the ratings let's, from last night. Let's not go there. No, 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 no. Is he a that's, priest now? That's podcast. I need, stuff, I, need, I need to follow this man's history to make sure he ain't got more people jumping up and down. <laughs> um, okay. So for those of you that watch the podcast, before we actually come on and before the first thing you guys all hear on the radio, we do a pre-roll ad. The pre-roll ad is for a company called Manscaped out of Carlsbad. And um, we, yeah, we can curse on that because no, it's not radio, you know, and we kind of get a little bit more raw. And um, I was telling this story about how, and I've told this story before on radio. I never when, heard it. Yeah. When, when I was in middle school, like sixth, seventh grade, like seventh grade, I swear to you, I didn't have a hair on my body. Okay. And when you're in seventh grade and your, your friends are all starting to, their voices are getting deep and, you know, hairs growing under their arms. You're like, what the hell's going on with me, man? Like, where's mine? So, so when I was in seventh grade, they used to make a shower after gym class because I grew up in Florida. And so, you know, blue shorts, white t-shirt, you're out running the track, you're playing tennis, soccer, whatever you were doing at PE back then. And you're sweaty, you know, you're, you're, you're sweating because it's hot. Mm -hmm. So then they want you to shower. So you don't stink like a mother when you go to class. Right. So every kid had a locker and a lock. And so we, after, after gym class, we'd have to shower. So go into the shower. I'm humiliated, right? I'm seven. I'm in seventh grade. I'm 13 years old. There's not a hair on my body, but everybody knows that one guy who in, in like by seventh grade was already like full, full blown beard. sweater. Yeah. <laughs> like, like we had one guy, he had literally hair all over his chest, hair all his over name? his back. God, I wish I could remember. I just remember he was an Italian dude. I got it. You know? I, I got it. I had one of my closest friends in middle school, Juan Villa, this homeboy, look like he was 40 years old and he was 12. He had a, <laughs> you could see the five o'clock shadow after shaving. I was like, what's the matter with you? <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and actually there was one guy, there's another guy, there's a black guy named Greg Cooper. Greg went on to become our, uh, like our band leader, you know, the marching band, you know, and he, it was a big prestigious position. We had 300 kids in the marching band that played at half times of high school games, but we were in like seventh grade. And, um, I remember him too. I was like, this kid's already got his stuff developed. And here I am, I'm the same age and I'm getting in the shower and he looks like a grown man and I look like a little baby, you know? And, and then when we would come out of the shower, none of us knew how weird this was at the time. There was this coach, his name was Coach George. He was this older guy. He was probably in his like 60s or early 70s back then. I don't know. And when the boys would come out of the shower, you know, he'd be going, oh, you want a towel? Here, jump, jump, come get this towel like a dog. You know, like a naked so dog. Freaking gross, dude. So weird. And none of us knew anything about it. Like, we didn't know about this stuff back then. And it, he didn't, not that I know. I mean, he <laughs> wasn't inappropriate other than, you know, making you jump for a towel. That was inappropriate. That, that, they're in, that's they're about in, as inappropriate <laughs> as it gets, that's brother. Pretty I'm bad. Sorry. Yeah. That's pretty bad. Yeah, I guess it's pretty bad. Worse now that I'm saying it out loud. <laughs> and on radio. <laughs> and on podcast. And on YouTube. But, but, uh, but for all of California. But everybody always knew a guy who by 13 years old needed to manscape himself. Come on, Browner. You had to know that guy too. Uh, the only kid I can even think of, uh, when I was a senior in high school at, here at Horizon, there was a kid named Mesron Evans. Mesron was like 6'3", like 220 freshman year and had a straight beard, could buy liquor. 
Like he could walk across the street at 7 Eleven in Claremont from the school and buy a 40 ounce if he wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> and he was Mesron was the nicest person you could ever meet in your life. A really sweet kid, but looked like a super, super 35 year old man in his freshman year of high school. We had a guy when I was in seventh grade. I wish I could remember this kid's last name. I just remember his first name was Alfonso. And I was petrified of this kid. Okay. He was black. He was freaking yoked like already. I mean, he's in seventh grade and he looks like an NFL linebacker, you know, freaking Nick, yoked. Nick Saban offered him a scholarship. <laughs> Probably would have, right? And, and so, so he's black guy who's freaking yoked like a real grown man. And everybody was afraid of him. Like, like if, if nobody would mess with this guy, cause he'll kick your ass right on the spot, you know? And, um, <laughs> and he was also the smartest guy. So he was the biggest, the strongest and the scariest, but he was also the smartest. He had straight A's. He was like the number one guy in the entire school. Right. <laughs> so whole we were, we were, yeah, he was the whole deal. And, uh, but he could dunk in Ooh. seventh grade like a man, like we'd be in the little middle school gym. And all I was thinking about was, Oh my God, I can't believe I have to go take a shower with all these guys. I don't have a hair on my body. And Alfonso is Dr. J from the freaking free throw line flying through the air and dunking, you know? And there was only one guy who had the balls to stand up to Alfonso. It was the last <laughs> day of school. One well, guy, the dumb one, guy, the one guy. And he was the Italian guy, you know, and it was, it was, it was straight out of the movie. It was like straight out of Eddie Murphy, you know, like, like, Hey, I'm freaking Italian. I just saw Rocky, you know, Hey, you see that big black guy right over there? Watch this. I'll freaking show him. Right. And Eddie Murphy, you guys ever hear this bit? Yeah. No. So good. Oh my God. So Eddie good. Murphy. Well, he goes, he walks up to this black guy is another name for him. Right. And he tells him, yeah, let me get a little juju fruit. Let me get a little this. That. He goes, and the big black guy here is going to pay for it. And, and the black guy goes, excuse me? <laughs> and he goes, you heard me. You pay for my candy. And the black guy goes, oh, I see. You just saw Rocky, little Italian <laughs> man. <laughs> and so why don't you just go get in your IROC Z28 and go home, you know? And so it was just a funny bit about how Italian guys thought they were tough guys against black guys because they all had seen Rocky. All right, Rocco, right? Dude, the same thing happened when people watch UFC fights. It's, it's, uncomfortable to watch ufc fight around a lot of smaller white guys who do crossfit they all get very aggressive they all get very loud they all get very scary like they want to lock eyes with you all of a sudden it's Is that pretty right? funny yeah really? well so there was one guy who was willing to fight alfonso last day of school and he was the guy that was the hairy guy so he's a hairy guy he's 13 and as far as like white Italian guys go, he's 35 years old. Okay. He got hair all over his body. Alfonso, the black guy, he can dunk from the free throw line. He's a grown man. He's scary. And both of them were like the two straight A students that were the two tough guys in the school. And the last day of school, man, right in the middle of the hallway, they went at it. They just, it was a full boxing match right Go there. On. I remember Alfonso winning. Yeah. That's normally how it happens too. That's the, see, that's about the thing right. about the big guys. No one messes with them, so they have no experience yeah. when it comes down to actually throwing blows. They don't know what to do because no one messes with them. No, but Alfonso the black guy beat up Dominic the Italian guy. But the story later on goes, I mean, this kid had everything going for him because he was from a tough part of town and he, he didn't have any privilege of any kind in his life. And and he had and but yet he had all the brains and all the brawn and the looks and the athleticism. He kind of had the whole package. And I think when we were either later in our teens or maybe not long after graduating high school, but I, I don't remember. Maybe it was maybe it was in our teens. Got stabbed and killed in oh, a Jesus. in a in a um, in a in a fight over a card game over like five dollars. Oh. You know, yeah, I know. Isn't that crazy? Way to bring it down. Friday yeah. afternoon. How's it yeah. going? Yeah, you couldn't just have yeah, left it at the fact that the little guy won. Yeah, no, no, the big guy won. The big black oh, the big guy won. Big black guy beat up the little Italian guy. Oh, we talked. We listen. We talked about this yesterday. People who stab, they stab. Stab or stab, so you got to be sure. careful when somebody whip a knife out. Just call it a day, give them whatever they want, because they they good at stabbing. Yeah. You know yeah. what's crazy is it just is it so kids nowadays in high school they got phones. Why don't we see more like I don't not ad like you know advocating for it to happen, but why don't we see more like school fight videos? Oh, because I remember there was fights daily at my high school, just Dude. all the time. I remember this one time at, at my freshman year, these this like cholo gang showed up. 
<laughs> they didn't even go to our school. Jumped the fence to fight the varsity football team. And I was like, is this what high school is like? Mm-hmm. Is this what's going to like? I literally a, a gang of cholos is showing up to fight the football team. And they don't even go here. Uh, and then it's like now, like, how come I don't see this stuff all over like TikTok and stuff? Dude, you, you're not following the right people. I think I'm, I am following the right people if I'm not seeing it. Maybe. I'm Mr. Fight. <laughs> I see it all the time. Chicago public schools, we having brawls in the hallway. Straight brawls. Yeah. I've seen some um I've seen some videos like you ever see that one where the, the like big guy is kind of picking on the little guy and then somehow the, the little guy like picks him up or somehow and throws him down and really messes him up bad, but you're like, well, you shouldn't have picked on that little guy, you know? I saw a video the other day where um these guys this guy's on like a crotch rocket motorcycle yeah. and he's he's like downtown at a stoplight and he's revving his motorcycle. Vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> and you know how annoying that is. Motorcycle. You know, Why did you motorcycle. make that face when you were doing that? Because <laughs> it like sounds like you have to go to the bathroom. Vroom, 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 you know? And and so so this guy's on one of these crotch rocket motorcycles and he's at a stop sign. He's just revving the engine, you know? And so these two guys are standing there with their girls, and then one guy walks over to him and says something. And the guy on the bike looks at him. And the next thing you know, the guy who's standing off the bike kicks the bike, kicks it, right? Just kicks his bike. Like, shut up, man. Like, why are you doing that? Like, why are you blowing your exhaust all over us? This guy gets off his motorcycle, goes up to the two guys that are there now. And with a left and a left, knocks both of them out. Double left. Gets him back on his bike and goes, and takes off. Dude, I just watched this uh, backyard MMA fight. Um, it was on TikTok, and this guy was literally the size of Fat Bastard from Austin Powers, like monster guy, like monster. And this other guy he was fighting, still big, bigger than me, but still like you know not as big as the first guy. And you're like, what kind of MMA match is this going to be? Fat Bastard knocked the guy out with a head kick. I was like, that, that's possible. That's athleticism, like, dude. This dude got the leg up high, and I was like, "Okay, this is the kind of MMA fight that UFC needs because that is entertainment right there." <laughs> the fat boy division, I like it. Yeah, yeah. You know, not no, super heavyweight, not ultra two fat, heavyweight. Two fat dudes, just fat boys. All right, I like. Just imagine Butterbean throwing a head kick. That's what it was. All right, look, we're just getting underway now. It's Friday afternoon. I told what you a, I was in a great, great mood. opening conversation for the show. I told you Friday. these guys were in a great mood. I mean, I'm not like jumping in like, oh, hey, I better talk about what happened to the Dodgers last night. But can you we? Know, we can. We absolutely can. I, I, I'll bet you Padre fans are loving what happened to the Dodgers last night because Dodger fans, you know, have an arrogant, entitled um, sort of expectation which is, okay, we bats woke up, Kershaw's on the hill, we win, tie it up, we go on, and we win this thing. Did not happen that way. We're just underway. Got a monster show on Friday. Stick around. Hey, great friends, on a Friday afternoon, what is happening? Yeah, feeling good today. Feeling really good, as a matter of fact, along with the crew. Man, grande Alejandro Padilla repping the 805. You feeling good because the total T kicked in or what? Oh yeah, I went to the total T clinic yesterday. True story. Um, because you know this this Iron Manish race tomorrow, and I thought I gotta have every possible human advantage known to man, right? Mm-hmm. So I went yesterday to the total T clinic. I walked in. It's so easy, by the way. It really is because you walk in, and there's like nobody there. Uh, I mean, except the people working. And I walk in, and I'm like, "Hi, how you doing? It's Scott. I wanted to come in and get a T shot over here and a B12 shot over here." And I walk in and they took me, uh, took me about two minutes in the waiting room. Uh, I had my mask on. They had some, you know, hand sanitizer. I felt great. I walked in, I met the new nurse that I had just met for the first time. Gorgeous, by the way, absolutely spectacular, gorgeous, sweet as can be. We actually talked quite a bit about why the B12 from Total T Clinic is so effective, et cetera. And then she gave me a shot on both sides. I walked out, I was ready to attack the world. And now thanks to the Total T Clinic, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling ready to go. Um, Good luck tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Big day. Big day. Okay. Um, Grande is in the house. Big Brown is here in the house. And uh, we got a great show coming up today. Um, We're going to (laughs) play. We're (laughs) going to. We're going to have our. Make that noise. (laughs) Pretty bad. (laughs) Very bad. It was. Yeah. Yeah, Pretty bad. My bad. Uh, We're going to have our picks coming up later on today with House Money. And by the way, I found a new app for us to use so that John doesn't have to write it down in his diary anymore. (laughs) You guys should download this app. Seriously. It's called Yuda, U-D-D-A, Yuda. Uh And then what we can do is we can all have accounts 
and we can track our picks on their app. So you say Yuda. Yeah. Because I saw them on Sided, and then their Twitter name is uh, Yuda underscore winner. And now it makes sense. Yuda winner. Yeah. Yuda Yuda man. Yuda winner. Yeah. So uh, it's a friend of mine's app, and he called me the other day, and he goes, hey, I was watching the show, and I see you guys are doing your picks. Why don't you guys do your picks on Yuda? And I went, why didn't I think of that? And so if everybody listening downloads the Yuda app, that would be really cool. And then we could all make our picks there, which would be kind of fun. Let's do it. So uh, Lee Sterling will be here today with his picks. Uh, Latchkey Brewery today yeah. on a beer Friday, which is really cool. Really cool. Um, I don't know much about Latchkey, so I'm looking forward to learning about him today. I think it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, the last time I significantly... Uh, was intoxicated, started at Latchkey. Started. I didn't get, it didn't happen there, but it, it was one of those days. I think you guys even remember, it was the day, uh, it was the Sunday before our first show of 2020. And remember I showed up to you to your house and I was like, drunk, the most hungover I've ever been, ever. That was, that started at Latchkey. There's nothing that stops this guy, ladies and gentlemen. It, it, the worst hangover of his life, a two-time corona survivor minus a positive test on either one. There is just nothing that stops this man from coming to work. That's right. That's right. Nothing stops this guy. Um, okay. So we got a great show on the way, and I'm really excited about it. But uh, let me start off with this. So I don't know how many Padre fans out there just don't even watch baseball playoffs anymore. You know, they, they just were like, well, Padres lost to the Dodgers. I'm out. I don't really care. What, what, what does a Padre fan care about right now? You know, the Tommy Pham story, just because of the sensational nature of it. Mm-hmm. Um, the, maybe the report that Will Myers is trade bait. Um, but really, I think the bigger conversation is what are the Padres going to do to lock up Fernando Tatis Jr.? These are the storylines that a Padre fan might be thinking how about, about. How about Dennis Lynn saying that the Padres are – going to actively look to trip to move will myers yeah i don't know how i feel about that why would, uh, they, my, why would they do that yeah my first thought I is is, is is like so he finally had a season where he lived up to the hype and he lived up to the contract and you got a powerful home run hitting decent enough defensive right fielder why would you give up on him now and the only thing that i could think of if I was putting myself in AJ Preller's position was let's sell high. You know, we, we may have seen the best of Will Myers this exactly year Exactly what he said in a shortened season with no fans in the stands with no pressure or so we all kind of put two and two together and said, he's a head case. Um, I just feel like if, if you're probably not going to get any better from Will Myers than what you got now on the flip side, why break up a team that, had this kind of fun and this sort of a run, unless you think this will Myers can bring us pitching. But according to them, they have pitching in their farm system. That's the number one thing that they supposed to have coming up. Yeah, and you can only have so many people. If, if they're looking at moving him, I would say it has to be more financial than anything, because if you're preparing to pay to tease and you are probably preparing to probably go after Trevor Bauer financially, you probably need to clear some space. That makes more sense than anything because he makes so much money. Other than that, if it's not financially driven, I think it's a stupid move. The guy finally showed up for you. He's great as a teammate. The the actual community recognizes him because he's kind of the sufferable fan or the sufferable player who went through all this losing, and now it's part of the the winning, and people can identify him along with Tatis. I I just I don't I don't really understand why they would look at moving him if it was not financially driven. Well, that's that's what, according to to the report or the article it says it would be a surprise if the Padres do not explore the market for Will Myers. He's owed the non-prorated portion of twenty million dollars next year and the year after. He's coming off a career season, although a significantly shortened one. He's almost thirty with a long track record of inconsistency. It wouldn't be a surprise if the Padres try to sell high, but. The Padres could end up concluding he's more valuable on their team because few teams are going to be interested in adding an expensive 30 year old outfielder. Yeah. Yeah. I, a good point, though, JB. I mean, I think it's a good point. When did, when did 30 when become bad money? in baseball? Well, it's it's not necessarily it's not necessarily 30. It's the inconsistent 30. Did he have a, a standout year this year? Yes. But like you said, Will Myers has been super inconsistent. So are, do you take the risk of one more year at $20 million and 
just hope that he gets to finally ride it out? Oh, or let, do you like try and sell high? It's it's a it's a good question. He didn't say they were for sure going to do it. Let me pose, let me pose a question to both of you guys. Do you think that his success was environmentally driven? That this team had such a good vibe on it, it allowed him to kind of relax and just play baseball. Alex, you said all year they put him at one position, said you're going to be here. He got consistent yeah. at bats, and all of a sudden, the guy who you paid to show up showed up when you started paying him. What if you're going to now jeopardize that? You're going to jeopardize your clubhouse for what? Now, if you get Trevor Bauer with the money you trade, I don't think Will Will Myers Myers is. Listen, dude, I don't think Will. If you trade Will Myers, you're not trading like this clubhouse glue. Let's be real here. Not (laughs) saying that you are, but there are certain things that are unexplainable. It depends what you get back, too. Yes, 100%. And by the way, we talk about financial, but what if they go out and make a trade for a pitcher who's about the same price? Like you might say to yourself, what do you want? Do you want a starting pitcher who's got a track record of health and success? Trevor Bauer at 25 million or Will Myers at 20 million? Right. That's an easy one for me. The thing is you don't have to trade for, for, for Bauer. So you'd have to add that. You'd have to add that. But I'm saying like, that's a, isn't, would you see that as a win-win? Like, Hey, we got something for Will Myers and we got Trevor Bauer. Like, what's more valuable to this team when you look at what happened in the postseason, albeit the two injuries? It's hard to say that um, it's just an easy, quick split decision. It would have been a year ago, right? but because Will Myers had such a monster year. They tried a year ago. But but let's not forget one thing about Will Myers. Give him him one great piece of credit here. You know, we're all going to remember that game against the Cardinals, game two, where Tatis hits the two home runs, right? Yeah. But let's not forget who also hit two home runs in that game. Exactly. You know, and so while you may be thinking to yourself, if you're AJ Preller, okay. you know, right. You might be thinking to yourself, you know, um, what we really need is better pitching. We have an ample amount of, of offense. And the reality is, is that if you took Will Myers out of this offense, you've just taken out 25% of your home runs. I mean, I'm just, I'm making up a number here, but it's maybe that's too many, but you, you probably had Ted Tease during the regular season, all total. Let's say Ted Tease had 20. Myers then would have had 18 ish, 15, 18. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Manny had same numbers, 15 to 18. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm saying all done they, through the playoffs. That, so but then to, to counter your point, Scott is how, how much do you really believe in jerks and Profar? Cause he's the guy that would take over the outfield spot who also hit seven home runs and a lot less at bats and had a bounce back year too. Like you traded for Profar already. So you already put some sort of even as small as the investment was, you put some investment into Profar, you put investment into Fam, you put investment into Myers. So it's like, so are you are you losing home run numbers? Yes, but is that a proven home run track record? No, no, no it's not. I'm starting to think that the the farm system they don't believe in the guys that they have as front line pitching. Because if you're time, though, but like, how can you not? Because you look oh. at what Paddock's doing in the struggles. Like you see, you realize that it takes time. How so, much time? I don't know. Every because 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 now you don't have time to burn. So you mean to tell me you can call up Weathers? He can look like a starter, but you can't do the same thing to Gore, who's supposed to be talking about one inning. But I know how, Scott, how long I know do you Scott, need? I know Scott well, named him a Cy Young after the inning, but I'm but saying it, like it's <laughs> one inning. Dude. I know, but here's but here's the thing. But Browner, here's the thing: is that like I I you guys know I got this buddy of mine here in town. His son was a first round draft choice of the Kansas City Royals. He was the number five overall pick. The dude took years, literally years, to get his body and his health right. They'd yep. pitch him, then he'd get hurt. Then he'd come back, then he'd get hurt again. And just when they thought he was ready, oh, something doesn't seem right. Or or there's a circumstance that happens and he's not called up. It, it, I'm with you, John. I don't think they think that Mackenzie Gore is quite ready. They obviously were in a desperate enough spot where they're like, we got one guy, one spot. We're going to need him for one or two innings. Who would you rather have, Weathers or Gore? And by the way, both of those guys are first round draft choices. They're big money, you know, signees. Um, one guy was more ready right now than the other guy. Do they not believe in them? I would say they don't believe in them right now. But all of this, just by the way, side note, we're talking about what would Padre fans be thinking about assuming they've stopped watching baseball? Because it went on last night. Did, yeah. d- did anybody watch the Dodgers and the Braves last night? Are, are Padre fans not watching? out of just hate viewing. Like, don't you, as a Padre fan, don't you want to see the Dodgers get knocked out? I will say this. See, the World Series that I wanted to see was the Dodgers and the Astros. That would that's, be great. 
That's the drama that I want to see. If Atlanta plays Tampa Bay, oh my God. Oh. Frankly, I'm really not interested. And by the way, I should be interested because my son and I were having a conversation this morning. The Tampa Bay Rays are doing what the Padres are hoping to do. Yep. They're the smaller market franchise that built through their, their farm system, cultivated much of their own talent, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, there's a couple of former Padres Renfro that are on this Tampa. Yeah. I mean, Margot is there and uh, and Hunter Renfro. And these are guys that you cheered for uh, as the Padres. You These were supposed to be up and coming Padre stars. They're now in Tampa. So because you don't have a Dodger hater club card, mm -hmm. I don't think like you're getting Dodger fans coming at you the way Charger fans do. Right. And I've noticed this. Remember that video I put out on Monday where you said like, I don't care if you think I'm salty, blah, blah, blah. I love watching the Chargers lose. Mm -hmm. That video has yet to stop getting notifications on it from Charger fans hating you. So like I compare Padre fans watching the Dodgers, the same thing. You're watching it to watch them lose and you're enjoying it as much as you would be enjoying watching the Padres win because watching Gratterall get blown up yesterday, I seen so many tweets about, even I tweeted out, like I blew the, I tweeted the picture out of him kissing. I was like, bye-bye because you sucked yesterday. Like that brought me joy. And I think a lot of Padre fans are on the same boat. You're watching to hate and watch them lose. All right. So tell me the story about you and your friends then. Yeah. Getting into a couple of arguments about things right. like okay get, jump right into this. Oh. this this is this is exactly why the cited debates app is perfect i'll give you an example there's a guy in las vegas uh his name is scott gilbranson he's got a radio show on raiders nation radio in las vegas he's from san diego he lives in vegas his twitter is at lv gully him and his partner on radio got into an argument on the air about and you guys can jump in on this but when you eat pop tarts do you eat them out of the, the aluminum foil bag or do you toast a pop tart? What's the right way to eat a pop tart? Browner? Toasted. I don't, I, I, I'm not really a big, I'm a toaster strudel guy. <laughs> oh, he's so, so fancy. Hey, I'm not really a pop. Bougie. Pop tarts are kind of dry to me, so I've never gotten into them. So I, I toast it, I guess. I've eaten them both ways. It just depends. Like, am I sitting down to eat them like at home? Then I'll toast them. If I'm just grabbing a one at 7-Eleven because there's nothing else, then I'll just, I don't care. I'll eat it out of the wrapper. Preference is a little toast, a little toast. Cause like what Browner says, if not, you're going to be, it's like you're chewing on flour. Like it's yeah. pretty dry. I loved pop tarts, man. My mom, I'd be like, mom, what's for breakfast? She'd be like, get a pop tart. I'm like, really? So the chocolate ones with the chocolate frosting with the chocolate on the inside bomb. I also love the strawberry ones that are like the, the, the vanilla OGs. looking cake with yeah. the, with the, with this, with a multicolored sprinkly sort of icing top with the like strawberry the, stuff in the middle. I haven't had one in years, but the one I do remember enjoying was the caramel one. I think like the, like the tan top and like a little caramel middle. Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Dude, when I was in high school, so we were poor and I went to a friend, <laughs> I went to a friend's house. Funny you start talking about Pop Tarts. And they had toaster strudels, right? And so I had one and I was like, oh my God, this is great. I go home to my mom. I'm like, hey, when you go to the grocery store, can you get some toaster strudels? She goes, what the hell is a toaster strudel? So we go to the store. She sees how much they cost. She goes, hell no, no way. <laughs> so I just I just stole them. So I steal them. We get to the house. I'm eating one. And she goes, where'd you get that? I said, well, I got it from the store. So how'd you get that? So I paid for it when you left. I went back inside. She didn't really Liar. watch me a lot as a kid. Liar. <laughs> so after Liar. that, I just went to the same store and I just stole them for like a year and a half till I got tired of eating them. Where'd you put them when you would walk out of the store? Like when you'd steal them, where'd you put them in your jacket? You put them down your pants? In the junk. Really? You yeah. That's you know, the phrase, big sacks, big max. You feel me? You ain't got to jump up and down when you leave the store. You just got to walk right out. Big sacks, <laughs> big strudels. You feel me? <laughs> <laughs> all right browner uh nice go back and pay that you know make no. that good man make yeah, it good dude. no make it right, it's like man. a total of like 20 bucks dude just make it right drop 20 bucks at the grocery store go make a, it right a year and a half of those things it's not 20 bucks okay a hundred dollars just go, go make it right all right I, I i gave it back to the universe a long time ago at pacers <laughs> <laughs> you, you you paid it forward at pacers yeah huh? I, put, I put somebody through a semester of college so so alex get yeah. back to this though so this all this this is if you're a padre fan you would think you'd still be watching the dodgers hoping that they lose but i think that many padre fans just stop watching baseball 
So yeah. tell me about the story about you and your pals. Right. Getting so into the as you guys know, I have a bunch of Dodger friends and they were just so cocky during the Padre season as they should be. They swept no big deal. Um, that doesn't mean that once we're out that we're going to stop talking trash though. So classic Kershaw showed up yesterday. You know, he got bombed for like five or four runs in the, in the game. And this conversation comes up from Dodger fans is Clayton Kershaw a hall of famer. A lot of them saying no. And I was like, you guys are freaking crazy. This guy is a first ballot Hall of Famer. And all of them, being salty Dodger fans that they are, they're like, your playoff performances negates his Hall of Famer. He's not a Hall of Famer. You have to perform in the playoffs. So it got me thinking, and I just put it on sided. Like, do you think Clayton Kershaw is a first ballot Hall of Famer? And um, right now, 60% of people are saying yes, that he is a a first ballot Hall of Famer. (laughs) So I think a lot of... Dodger fans, though, are the ones that are saying no because they're so upset at his performances. I think you're right. I think anybody who's like a um, like outsider looking in, even though Kershaw's playoff numbers, I'll put them up on the screen in a second. P- Kershaw's playoff numbers. Here we go. So for those of you watching, here it is. For those of you listening on podcast platforms or on the radio, in the regular season, Clayton Kershaw's ERA, this is cumulative, is 2.43. Uh, his win percentage is nearly 70%. And he gives up less than one home run per nine innings. In the postseason, his ERA is nearly doubled at 4.31. His win percentage is almost in half, cut in half at 42%. 47. And, thank you. And his home run uh, per nine innings Doubles. is twice as much. Yeah. So, so look, there is no – Marty Schottenheimer used to say it all the time. The facts are the facts. The numbers don't lie. Marty Schottenheimer knew the the statistics said, I'm a great head coach in the regular season. In the postseason, my record says I'm a bad head coach. Clayton Kershaw's regular season numbers say he's a Hall of Famer. His postseason numbers say he's trash. And when people say he's a surefire Hall of Famer, I, I hate these kinds of debates, but I know lots of people have them. Yeah, Alex, if you put it back up on the screen, if you go into the sided mobile app. So for those of you that are listening, do your boy a favor here. I've been working on this thing for three years. I'm out hustling every day. People are scoring up that leaderboard. I see Bernard Thompson up at the top of the leaderboard. You guys know that Bernard Thompson donated $20 yesterday to the Challenge Athletes Foundation for this item manage? That was cool, man. Nice. My donation is coming go. today. Yeah. Oh, thanks, man. But yeah. anyway, if you go back to that question, is Clayton Kershaw a Hall of Famer? It's like most people outside of Dodger fans are like, yeah, of course he's a hall of famer. And then there's Dodger fans that are pissed off and he hasn't done anything for him in the postseason. They're like, no, he's not. And just the, real the, quick, the real greed, quick too. Oh, the, go for it. Go for it. The greed and disgust of Dodger fans just makes me want to vomit. The only person <laughs> they've never turned on is Kobe Bryant and probably Magic Johnson. Other than those two, they don't turn on anybody. We Dodger turned on Magic fans. when he was the VP. Oh, that's right. You're right. That's <laughs> that's so fickle. Kobe Bryant is the only guy they've never turned on. It, Clayton Kershaw last year showed up in the playoffs. Did that not count for anything? They no, didn't win the World Series last year. Yeah, he, I thought he did. Dude, dude, he got bombed in the in against the Nationals. What you talking about? That's a World Series. Listen, anyway, no, it was in the wild card no. round. Clayton Kershaw is the greatest pitcher of all time. Eat that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, him and Carson Wentz are the best. Shout all out. Right, don't go anywhere. We got a great show coming up. Lee Sterling right around the corner. Alex, what is next? Is Lee next? Yes. All right. Lee's next. We're going to give you our picks with house money. Then Lee's going to give you a pros picks. Yes. All right. Lee Sterling coming up next. Hey, great friends. Yeah. Friday afternoon. I am ready for the weekend. Actually, uh, I'm kind of stoked because uh, tomorrow morning we're going to do this Ironman for the Challenge Athletes Foundation. Not in shape at all. Have no business asking my body to do this. Oh, and then, by the way, going to try and rest up on Sunday. Monday, we come back on the air. And Monday night, something I never do, I'm actually going on the air in L.A. on Monday night because they've got a like Lakers parade in the whole middle of the block of the day. They got like Jeannie Buss and Frank Vogel, and they got – players and so there's no la parade for the lakers but there's a radio parade for the lakers that's cool and, great and yeah. thinking that's good yeah. thinking yeah and that's then, what happens and then, when you have a willing partner yeah and then and then i come on at night <laughs> like uh yeah all that fun and celebration and everybody involved earlier and yeah here's uh here's taylor horn tucker 
Yeah. Here, here's, <laughs> here, here's your relief pitcher that you never heard of before. Who's just eating up innings. That's, that's kind of what I'm doing up there. So look, we have a, a great show coming up. Lee Sterling is going to be here in a matter of moments. Lee's going to give us his college football and NFL picks. And if you're following Lee, he's been doing really well. Uh, Browner was on fire last week. Most of us actually had pretty good weeks, but Browner was unbeaten, as I recall. So I want I would say this, Browner, we should all download my friend's app, Uda, U-D-D-A, Uda, and we can make our weekly picks on that app. But I got to get to know it better because it's pretty new stuff. So, okay. Uh, house money. Playing with house money today will make our picks on the games that Lee's going to pick for you. And then Lee can, can tell us whether he buys our picks or not. And we'll just play his picks, not our picks. You ready to go? Let's do it. All right, gentlemen. First game of the week. I I know nothing about. See, any this of these is games. where this is where you need Lee. Like the college who, games. Who the hell bets BYU versus Houston? Houston has had, if I if I'm correct here, five games postponed because of yeah. COVID. Like they legit have missed four or five games because of COVID. And this game is tonight at six thirty in Houston. BYU is favored by six five points. Five yeah. points. Yeah, so interesting. Um, of course, I would never have any interest in a game like this, right? Who would? Unless you're a gambler. Like the yep. gambler, that guy, whoever he is out there, and you know who you are, fellas. The gambler is the guy that looks at the games and goes, I don't really care about BYU versus Houston. Like I care about Pitt versus Notre Dame. Yeah. Some people care about Alabama versus Georgia, right? Carson but State versus Fresno State. Yikes. Is that happening this weekend? No, it's next week, next Friday. Okay. All right. Hey, remind me, I want to talk about the Carson State Aztecs because um, I want to tell you guys about hearing about some things that are going on down there. Okay. So remind me to talk about the are Carson we have State Brady Aztecs. Should we have Brady Hoke? Should we ask Mike to put Brady Hoke on? It'd be great. I'd love to have Brady Hoke on. You think anytime. they'll still, you think, are we persona non grata there like we are no, with the Padres? No, no, no. I don't think so. I don't think, I don't, I don't think we're persona non grata to the Aztecs. A Padres, oh, different deal. Hope not because I love the Aztecs. Yeah, and oh I can I, God. I oh. can trash them. I can trash them and still love them. It's the it's part about being alumni, Brown. You don't have to agree with everything your team does. But you spend all your time crushing the, your most famous alumni, other than Tony Gwynn. Well deserved crush. But when wow. he comes and gets his number retired, I love the kid. Hey, Browner, look, you know, you 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 say crushing the, the most famous alumni at San Diego State. Your whole point about the Clippers and why they blew up last year and why Doc Rivers ultimately got fired and why Ty Lu has ultimately now been hired. Your whole storyline about Kawhi being treated differently than everybody else, that Kawhi shows up and he's the ultimate superstar. And the guys who had been with the Clippers were like, wait a second, how come he gets treated that way and we don't get treated that way? Why is there this separation between superstar that just got here and the guys that have been helping build this whole thing? And according to the reports that are out there, um, that is a big part of why this team failed so badly this year. And that's why Doc Rivers got fired. And so, look, I mean, you can say what you want, but I mean, there is finally, Alex, there is some criticism out there for Kawhi. People starting to question like, so he left San Antonio because he couldn't get along with Popovich, didn't believe anybody in the organization. He went up to Toronto. He won, but he bailed after that. Like, maybe there is something that, here. That criticism and, and, is coming from me. Well, no, I've read it now. <laughs> oh, good. I've read it a, good. a lot of places. And, and look, here's the thing. If LeBron James would have walked into that Clipper locker room and LeBron James were treated the way Kawhi were treated, everybody else would have been like, yeah, that's, that's LeBron. Yep. But you see, nobody really considers Kawhi as an equal to a no, LeBron. No, slow down. Listen, listen, listen. That's not true. Yes, what what happens is Kawhi Leonard doesn't have the personality that LeBron James does. He's so a fun the, guy. And so the things that LeBron James does to smooth over the rough patches where he gets things that other teams, other players don't get, Kawhi didn't do that. And by the way, quite frankly, he probably didn't know how to do that because he's never been in that position. What so are you even the, talking about? This is the first time Kawhi's got preferential treatment on a as a franchise face. He didn't get that. In San Antonio, that was Tim Duncan. He didn't get that in Toronto. He was a hired gun, so Kyle Lowry got most of that. This was the first time the franchise was completely centered and focused around Kawhi Leonard, and he didn't handle it well. And it was his worst year. Not, the worst. Get out of here, worst right, year. Where were we? Where did were they we? make it past the second round? No. 
We were, we were on about, BYU we were about, versus Houston. Right. We were talking about the Carson State Aztecs, and it turned into a whole Kawhi and bashing. You want, and you have some inside info or something about house no, money. Really, house really money. Info, in, in, just not really inside info, but just I want to talk about San Diego State. Outside or, info. Or Carson N State. Naming a starting quarterback? I will get to that too. Okay. Hey, look, BYU is a five point favorite against Houston. You guys say this game is where? Is it in Houston? Yes. Okay. I know nothing about this game. I would never play a game like this, but if I were a gambler, I'd be looking for the best betting opportunities. So given I know nothing, given that Houston is home, given that Houston has had a bunch of games already postponed and BYU has played, I don't know why, but my gut tells me, take the home team. I'll take Houston to cover the five. I'm going to take uh, BYU because they've actually played some games, so I'll just go with them. Okay, Brown. I'm going with BYU because college football is different than pro football, and you got to hit guys. And yeah, I huh? don't know either. BYU's play. Houston hasn't. Houston has got like way too many COVID cases. They they haven't practiced enough. They haven't been able to go against each other. So I'm going to go with BYU. I didn't know it was their COVID cases. I thought it wasn't their COVID cases. I thought it was their opponents all the time. And BYU has like 27 year old dudes playing. So that's that's a good point. Mm. Alabama. Man. Alabama is a six-point favorite against Georgia. Where's this game at? This game is happening in nice. in Alabama. Okay. All right, so there's no Nick Saban. Oh, he's going to be there. Oh, he's going to coach. He's going to be there. Some way, oh, he's going to coach. Oh, he'll coach. He'll coach from home. They'll have a Saban cam. He'll be coaching via Zoom. They'll they'll let him do whatever he has to do. They I mean, better get some fast-ass internet because there's a delay, man. Okay, well. Alabama, six-point favorite at home against Georgia with their coach with a positive COVID This is a, at Desmond Howard. I believe Nick Saban will be on the field coaching tomorrow. Wow. Gross. Just gross. He's asymptomatic, too. Just disgusting. Mm. But it's, it's life and death, man. Hey, it's football. Double, double mask, baby. You, you, you don't think your, your university, your football team can't survive without you for one game, and no, you're not a good coach. Not Nick how Saban. About, how about this? And he's also like a $10 million a year coach. It's not right. like he's like – Man, I'm I'm coaching San Diego State. I don't want to miss this game because I really think that I'm talking eventually to Michigan, and I I, I don't want to. I mean, he's 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 already a legend. He's already a, a gazillionaire. What the hell is he doing? Anyway, I'll okay, Bama, I'll take Bama minus Me six. Too. I'll take Bama minus six too. They're gonna rally around their coach. Yeah, Nick Saban. I'm taking Bama because that drunk Nick Nick Sarkeesian can still coach, but whether Nick Saban is there or not. You mean Steve I, Sarkeesian or Nick Sarkeesian? Sarkeesian. They're yeah. both drunk. Okay. All right, we hey, gotta uh, rush. Let's keep going. Okay, real quick, so that we can compare our picks to Lee Sterling. Green Bay minus one at Tampa Bay. Who are you taking here, Alex? Uh, in Tampa, I will still take the Packers. I could see the Bucks winning, but but not. But I think the one point is good for the Packers. Okay. Browner. Oh, I'm taking Tampa Bay. I'm never picking the Packers. Yeah, I'm taking Tampa Bay too. Uh, Tampa Bay coming off the loss. This is now what about ten days ago or so. Yeah. And uh, the way they lost to the Bears, I'm going to take Tampa Bay at home to beat Green Bay. Okay. The Rams minus three at San Fran. Give me Brown. all of the oh, points oh, for the Rams, dude. Oh, oh, Rams, man. Freaking Rams. Niners, man. All right. I know. We'll, we'll all take the Rams. We'll all take the Rams. Okay. So, look, uh, I've got Houston. I've got Alabama. I think we all do. Mm -hmm. um, me and Browner have Tampa. We all have the Rams. You guys all have the same picks, except I took the Packers and you guys took the Bucks. Okay. All right. No, there. I picked BYU. Oh, I did too. Oh. All right. All right. All right hold we'll on. Figure wait, it out. Wait, wait. <laughs> now let's go from our lousy picks where we openly admit we don't know anything about these. these Four teams. and zero, baby. Four and zero. Yeah. Hey, listen. These are great picks. Hey, when, when it's a week to week league. It, I say lousy picks because we're like, hey, we don't know anything about this game, but we're going to pick it this way. And Browner goes four and zero, and all of a sudden he's a professional tout. Speaking of professionals. Paramount Sports in the house. Let's get to Lee Sterling. All right, here he is from Paramount Sports, representing South Florida, Miami, in the house this afternoon. Lee Sterling, the official handicapper to Kaplan and crew. Hi, Lee. How are you? Um, everything good in San Diego? Uh, yeah, things are pretty good, uh, at least in this part of San Diego. Alex and John, how about in your part of San Diego? So far, All so good. good. Yeah, All good. 70, what is it, 71 or 72 degrees today? You know, we yeah, just we just are wrapping up uh, a heat wave, Lee. It's been about 95 degrees every day. Wow. So today, it's 82 it's right now. 82 right now. Okay. Okay. What's it supposed to be tomorrow, Alex? Tomorrow is supposed to be... Oh, sorry, Browner. Eight. I know you, you like to handle the weather. On oh, yeah. The go for it, Browner. Go for it, Browner. All right. I mean, listen, listen. Tomorrow, it's supposed to be 
81, clear skies with a high a low of 64. Nice. Okay. Warm nice. water for you on La Jolla Shores. Yeah. Yeah, Lee, I'm doing something really dumb tomorrow. You want to hear about it, and then we'll get to your picks? Sure. I'm supporting the Challenge Athletes Foundation. It's an organization I've supported for many years. We're doing an Ironman-ish. So it's 140.6 miles. One mile swim in the ocean, 133-mile bike ride, six-mile run, walk, crawl at the very end, all to raise about <laughs> hopefully a little over half a million dollars tomorrow between about 50 people. Love it. Like that, Not huh? for me, though. Not for Enjoy. me. You don't want to <laughs> come, you come do it? No. No. I, I, first of all, I can't swim. More than about 75 yards. I can swim, but just never – just never materialized. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I can do like four or five laps in the pool. Just never got down the breathing thing. I mean, I can swim. I can, I can stay afloat for hours. Just, just can't swim. I can bike and I could probably jog four or five miles, but I could probably only bike maybe 50, 60 miles. So uh, better you than me. The question is how are your Pitt Panthers going to do down here? Did, did you ever come down? Did you ever play down here against Miami? I did. I played, uh, played in the Orange Bowl, which was like what a childhood was dream come true, probably in like 1991-ish. Okay. 90, yeah, like 91. Uh, we got smoked. It was uh, Gino Toretta. That was, you know, I think, I think yeah. Miami actually won the national championship that year that right. they beat us. Yeah. And, um, and I had a bunch of friends on that Miami team. My closest friend at the time, I mean, at least on that team, was a guy named Michael Barrow, who was a great oh. linebacker. Okay. Had a great career in the NFL. Yeah. 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 So. so Michael lives in Charlotte now and his daughter, I don't know if it's his, I think it's his oldest daughter. I don't know if he has an older son that might be his oldest. His daughter goes to North Carolina school of the arts uh, with my daughter. Oh, his cool. daughter's a freshman. My daughter's a senior. L so. Last time I saw him, he was, uh, he was working for Pete Carroll in the Seattle Seahawks. This is right. going back yeah. about two years ago. Hey, Lee, we've made our picks based on your picks. And this right. is we the week hear... that we freaking need you, man. We need you big time. <laughs> okay. we, we need your help. All right, All Lee, right. real quickly, before we get to your picks, yeah. tell everybody before you make them how they can reach Paramount Sports, what kind of deals you have in place, and how you're going to make all of our listeners who listen and watch on our podcast, listen in podcast platforms, and listen on 1090, how you're going to make everybody money this week. Fade you guys. That's it. I'm just going to find out what you guys like, and we're going to fade you guys. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> this week has been a little more challenging. i got to be honest with you. Two of my selections in college football, the game was called off. So it just forced me to work a little bit harder. I was going to release nine games. I'm going to release seven. So, that, and that's combined college and the NFL. So what I'm going to do is I know there's a lot of people out there that would love to come on board, but maybe they can't financially make the commitment or maybe, you know, they're not ready to commit for a month or a season. Every six or eight weeks, I do something different. How about this? Seven games combined, college and pros, four college Three in the NFL, 77 bucks. So I know if they invest 100, 200 bucks in wagering on my games per game, I think I can turn it into $1,000, $1,500. So found uh, seven big games, and it's an instant download. So all they need to do is once they purchase it, uh, you don't have to call back on Saturday morning or Sunday morning to get the games. Games are up and available. You got them. To, they're ready to go. Seven games, $77. ParamountSports.com is the website. I also do UFC. I do a weekly podcast for, for the UFC fights, and we've won 21 out of 26 uh, fight cards. We have five selections there for $55. Everything's available, ParamountSports.com, or call 800-400. Nine seven four one. Hey Lee, real quick side question about UFC. So yep. when a fighter who's fighting in the main event has to shave his head to make weight, does that yep. alter your picks? Because no, you know I he had a bad that. weight cut. Because you know he had a I terrible weight cut. Yeah, um, Brian Ortega, you're talking about. So yeah. uh, no, you, no, usually it doesn't. I saw that and I was like, that dude must have had the worst weight cut of his life if yeah. you have to shave that giant head of hair. I, I didn't. I didn't recognize him at first when he came out until they announced his name. So that was, that's interesting. I, my favorite is the guy that dresses up as a joker. You see him? <laughs> I didn't Last see him. Week. I got to check that out. Yeah. He dresses up as the joker with a face paint. Looks exactly like the joker. We went against him last week. That was my big selection. We went uh, guy named uh, Duplacy. He, uh, 
he ended up knocking him out in the first round. Nice. All right, Lee Sterling is here. So whether it's UFC fights this weekend or college or pro football games, you need to get a hold of Lee at ParamountSports.com. He's got some really great deals going for you right now, both with the NFL side or college football and NFL side and with the UFC fighting side. Okay, Lee, we've made our selections. Okay. We don't know anything about these games. Our audience is not likely going to know much about these games. So if you could, just give us, especially in the college games, give us your thumbnail. BYU minus five against Houston. Who do you got? Okay, I'm going with BYU. I like their quarterback, Zach Wilson. Here's what's interesting about this game. If BYU wins this game and runs the table, I think there's a better than 50% chance they're going to play in the college football semifinal because Pac-12's out, no shot, even if they go undefeated, even like in Oregon. The Big Ten may get – in one team and let's say Alabama beats Georgia big and then also wins big in the conference championship and then Clemson I think that's three teams so BYU's got a shot here their defense is ranked fourth watch their linebackers and DBs they cover they hit and they wrap up which is usually optional in college football right now from defensive backs and they don't get penalized they don't beat themselves. Houston, 10 penalties last week. They continue to do dumb things. And uh, BYU, just one to seven penalties their four games. BYU, 42-24. All right. Sounds like uh, Browner and Alex both had BYU. I had no reason to, to – I just went with the home team. I took Houston. Okay. Alabama minus six against Georgia. Rumors are Saban might be on the sideline. Okay, Lee, what's the right side of the game? Okay, so great offense for Alabama ranked – Number two in the country, 51 points a game. Other side, Georgia defense, ranked number two, allowing just 12 points per game. You have to be able to run the football on Georgia to have a chance. So Tennessee couldn't. Auburn couldn't. They had a lot of third and eight, third and tens. And Alabama, I think their offensive line and their running game with Harris, I think they're a cut above. So they're able to get four, five, six yards, get into some second and threes, second and twos, not third and longs often, they can, they can throw the ball deep. I mean, Jalen Waddell and Devonta Smith, two receivers, uh, they're going to be first-round picks unless they get hurt for Alabama. Hey, I think the Georgia defense is great. I think Kirby Smart is good. Bottom line here is Alabama at home, roll tide, 34-23. Okay, I think we all had Alabama, didn't we? Yep. I think so. Absolutely. Right, let's move on to the NFL. Alex, what game you got? The toughest game to pick, I think. Bucks, Packers, Packers minus one in Tampa. What do you think? So last week, if it was played last week, I probably would have gone with Green Bay. They're four and zero, but teams go to that bye week for some reason. Something happens. Not a must game. So we know in the NFL, it's not so much how good you are; it's the situational play. Tampa Bay has lost two games. It's a must win game. First time in a long time, Godwin and, and Evans will be back together. And TB12 back against the wall. They can't lose three games. I, I think they pull off this this win here. I, I think it's going to be a barn burner. Last team with the ball wins. I like Tampa Bay 34-30. Wrong team's favorite. All right. I got Tampa Bay in this one too. Browner too. That's right. I will never pick the Packers anyway. Rams, 49ers. The 49ers are falling apart. But yeah. who knows? It's football. It's a week-to-week -week league. Talk to me, Lee. It is, but there's some real problems. The two wins they have are against the Giants and the Jets. You know how many wins combined those two teams have? Uh, zero. zero or one. Yeah. yeah, donut. So the teams that they played besides that, the other three teams have a combined 3-8-1 and one record. Bose is not playing. They're secondary. Watch their saying. They're horrible. I, I don't think they can cover the receivers for the Rams here. Double revenge the Rams are playing with here. Right team's favorite here. The Rams, they win this game 28-7. I think that's an easy pick, too, because you don't yeah. even know who's going to be playing quarterback Some, for the Niners. You, you can't overthink it. Don't overthink the game. All right, there's Lee Sterling, Paramount Sports. Lee has given you today the Rams, Tampa Bay, Alabama, and BYU. Lee, um, to people who want your game of the week – and, and people who want to buy these, these college football NFL packages, people who want to buy fight packages to get all your picks. One more time, how should people reach you? Game of the week, Pittsburgh and Cleveland. That should be a lot of fun. Hopefully no helmet throwing, just maybe <laughs> a few, few nice, you know, fights, you know, a few blows to the midsection, a couple takedowns. Um, <laughs> both teams will be ready. That's going to be a fun game. You want to get that game, 800-400-9741. You want to come on board, like I said, Give us a shot. You give me one shot. 
I think you're going to roll with me to the Super Bowl. Seven games, $77. And in the UFC, five fight selections, 55 bucks. ParamountSports.com. 800-400-9741. Lee Sterling, Paramount Sports, the official handicapper to Kaplan and crew. Lee, thank you. See you next week. Thanks, guys. Have Thanks, a great Lee. weekend. Thanks, Lee. Great friends, Friday afternoon. What's up, everybody? What's going on? How's everybody doing, man? We're having a great day so far. Lee Sterling was just here, gave us his picks from Paramount Sports. If you want Lee, you can get him at 800 400 9741. He's got some really great specials. If you're a gambler, then you love this stuff, right? Like you're like, oh, hey, $77 is going to give me seven games. I'm going to make all my money back. It's a good investment. If you're not a gambler, you're like, guys, what's going on here? And um, all that's going on is that uh, I'm trying to play his picks. I'm trying to see how good he really is, you know? So if I just try and spread it out like five bucks per game, it just becomes a little bit more fun, a little bit of action. Okay. Um, I would like to say that coming up, I, uh, I have a close friend coming on the air. For those of you that are longtime listeners, you guys have heard him on the air before. His name's Blair Cannon. And Blair, years ago, Alex, I don't know if you remember this or not. Browner, you probably have never heard of this, but t- take a listen to this. My buddy Blair and I, about eight years ago, decided he was going to swim, Browner, check this out, from Catalina Island to L.A., 27 or 28 miles in the ocean. And by the way, when he jumped into the ocean that night, no wetsuit, um, like cold-ass water, midnight, 12 midnight, completely pitch black in Catalina to start swimming the channel, 28 miles shark infested waters, all kinds of creatures out there and uh, all to raise money for the Monarch school, which is the homeless school, uh, downtown San Diego, where, you know, there's this terrible, um, cycle of homelessness and it's kids too at living out of cars or boxes or hotel rooms or whatever. And this school is where these kids go. And, and we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars through Blair's suffering. He did all the hard work. I just went out there and kissed everybody's ass looking for money. So Blair and there's I gotta, decide there's got to be better ways to raise money. Like on the <laughs> list, on the list of like things that I never would even think about doing swimming in the ocean in the middle of the night for 28 miles is, is it near the top? You know, what sounds like something white people would do. I'm going to wrestle a Bobcat to raise money. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to wrestle. It's called Bobcat wrestling for safe Bobcats. That sounds like something white people do. You crazy swimming from swimming. First of all, swimming in the middle of the night is insane to begin with. You don't know what's out there, period. Because the further you go out, the less you can see. Now, I don't know what kind. I don't know what got into him. That's a great cause. Don't get me wrong. It's a great cause. No, it's a great cause. But trying to help less fortunate kids. But at the same time, living and living and and raising money are two different things. You can live (laughs) and raise money in other ways. That just sounds like a, some crazy talk to me. But you want to hear something really cool? So, so because he did that, um, just he, he's got a huge heart. He did it the following year. You guys will love this. He did it the following year, swimming all the way around New York City, like 27 miles, whatever yeah. it was. Okay, I know. Had to have like all kinds of shots before he oh, went. for crap that he was going to, you know, take he's in, in his mouth. And his nose. To, he's probably immune to coronavirus. I'm pretty sure he is. When you swim time. in that water for that long, yeah, yeah you can't get anything else. So over two years, we raised a lot of money. He did all the swimming work. I did most of the fundraising work. We Mm -hmm. just worked in tandem. And we've been pals since 2007. And, you know, we're neighbors. He lives right around the corner from me. And we we just, we ride together. We run together. We hang out. We work out. We're just, we're, you know, he's an investor in our company sided. I mean, he's just... He's just a, one of my closest pals. So anyway. Two best friends that anyone can have. We're the two <laughs> best friends that anyone can have. We do dumb stuff together. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's you it. guys. That's us. That's us. <laughs> so, so anyway, so Blair's going to come on. If you've never seen this video, Alex, I know I sent it to you earlier. I'm not sure if there's a way to pull it up or to let people know where they can find it and stuff. But this video, old school, one of our producers, you guys remember Pratty. Pratty went on the boat. So Blair jumps in the ocean in Catalina. Pratty's on the boat shooting video. He's got a GoPro camera. A whale jumps up next to Blair. Pratty catches the whole thing on video. Pratty's doing like reports into the radio show. And this is, it's all documented. It's all out there on YouTube. So Blair and I are going to tomorrow. We're going to try and do this Iron Man-ish thing together where we're going to, um, 
we're going to try and do this 140.6 miles this time to raise money for the Challenge Athletes Foundation. And uh, <laughs> Alex is showing this on the screen. For those of you watching, <laughs> Alex is showing this on the screen. For those of you listening, you can't see it, but if you is go that his on wife? YouTube, yeah, it's his wife. She's if like kissing YouTube, him goodbye. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, the, it's, it's called Canon Catalina Challenge Short Documentary. Canon Catalina Challenge. He jumps in the water in the middle of the night, dude. With a glow it, stick. Dude, it's, it's pitch black midnight. By the way, I promise you, this is no joke. It was Shark Week on Discovery Channel, you know? <laughs> you know what else you know? I wouldn't do? Be the kayaker next to him. I also wouldn't do that. Like, you don't know what's below you on a kayak. Kayak ain't going to do anything to save you. Mm. That is crazy, bro. I know. So, yeah, so he swam through the night. And when, we call, when they called the show, when Billy Ray and I got on the air at like 6 o'clock in the morning, Praddy calls the show. He's like, okay, guys, he's been swimming for six hours. He's on pace to break the world record. This is incredible. And so between like 6 a.m. and call it 9 a.m. that we were on the air, we were doing this all live. People were up on the, on the shore waiting for him to come in. And he went from like world record pace to uh, all of a sudden, you know, the tide started to change and he got, I'm sure, more physically that's, run down. Isn't that so cool? That's so, like, not, I don't know if cool is the right word, but isn't that one of the crazy parts about donating to something like that? You're like, yeah, I'll give you money to almost watch you die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, listen, the cause is fantastic, but what you're doing is, it sounds really, really dumb. So here's some money. Here's a lot of money, actually. Well, Man, that's, that's what I've been ice trying to say. Bucket challenge was my, I'm an ice bucket challenge guy. I'll post some water on me. I'm not getting in no ocean. <laughs> I've been saying to people, listen, here's the thing. You could come do the Iron Man-ish with us tomorrow. You can come to La Jolla Shores and swim in the ocean. You can ride a bike 133 miles and then run for six. Or how about just make it easy? Just donate. So yeah. Blair here, so my buddy Blair, who I'm talking about, he goes onto Facebook and Instagram and he puts out a picture of him carrying a challenged athlete out of the water at the triathlon in La Jolla every year for, for Challenge Athletes Foundation, which they didn't get to put on this year. He puts it on Facebook and Instagram. Guys, he has raised, just because people saw this on Facebook and Instagram, I promise you, we did this on Saturday. He and I did it together. He's raised $19,000 nice. in under a week. Okay? So people say to me, they go, oh, wow, $19,000. He must have a lot of really rich friends. I say to them, I go, who's making these donations? He told me one story about a woman who's a teacher. Her husband is a, a, a trainer, like in a gym who hasn't been working because the gym had been closed forever. And they donated $1,000. And he's like, I know they don't have that kind of money, but for whatever reason, they're moved by the cause. They, they know the sort of dumb stuff I do to raise money for big charities. You, know? you guys need a contact over at Ellen or something. Like the fact that this hasn't already been on some daytime talk show where they match a donation for you guys, because the cause is amazing. Um, the, the athletes found the challenge athlete foundation is a big foundation. It's not some little tiny thing. You guys raise how much yearly that this year you couldn't do like $3 million. You said 4 million bucks, yeah, 4 million bucks. Like how is this not on Ellen or something yet? Or the Kelly Clarkson show you about it? Something. And in addition to that, Ellen's about to get canceled anyway because of the way she's been mean to her staffers. This would be great for her. Oh, really? Ellen's yeah, been this, mean? This, Challenge this, Staff this, Foundation. Yeah, this would be great for her to <laughs> raise her Q rating back up. <laughs> yeah, supposedly she has a very toxic environment at the Ellen show. Didn't I've seen that. it. I've seen it. I've seen it up close. It's really? Real. Why so? Uh, because the way that she treats her employees. I watched Portia, her uh, wife, girlfriend at the time, uh, now or whatever. Just like literally be mean to the people working there just for no reason, just mm. no reason at all. Mm. And they were, they were waiting on her like she was a queen. Mm. It was, it was kind of interesting to watch. Were you there? Yeah. What were you doing there? I was filming something. Filming what? Uh, so this for Max, like F Max FM sort of. Yeah, yeah. 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 For Max FM, uh, Kim and Sammy Joe for Kim and Sammy Joe's excellent adventures. We went to the Ellen show. And so this was one of the other shows. We got a five hundred dollars gift certificate from Walmart. At the Ellen show? Yep. Everybody went crazy. Got? Yeah, oh. we missed, we missed, we missed the thirteen days of Christmas. And so we went on the fifteenth day and just because Ellen's awesome, she just gave everybody. I thought you just said Ellen was terrible. Yeah, I thought Ellen's a bitch. She didn't do it to me. Oh. So and she gave me five hundred dollars, so I ain't got no problem with her. Yeah, I love her. Yeah. You choose you choose to work for her, that's your problem. No, Get another man, job. I, I'm an Ellen fan. I didn't know Ellen was mean. I like Ellen. I, yeah. I do too. Dory, I love man. Ellen. 
She ain't never done nothing to me. And she made two Finding Nemo's. And a Finding Dory. Exactly. So I'm. Wait, wait, wait is there two Nemo's or is there a Nemo and a Finding Dory? You may be correct. I don't know. It's the never same saw, thing, isn't it? Never saw a Finding Dory. No, it's two Finding. Well, oh, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. Which one is the Seagulls? They're like, mine, 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 mine. That's the first one. All right. So I, I, I gave you the whole big setup about my friend Blair Cannon, about the swim from Catalina, the swim around New York City. And I said, this is my, I, I want to call him my training partner, but we haven't done any training. But tomorrow we're going to do it, man. We're going to do this Iron Man-ish for Challenge Athletes Foundation. The guy puts it out on, on Facebook and Instagram and in under a week raises $20,000 for this organization. This is the world of COVID 2020. This is how you put people on podcast and on radio you do it via zoom blair's in his garage working today because that's where he works now and let's say hello to blair cannon hi blair hey scott how you doing doing really good yourself i'm doing really well can you hear me awesome i'm getting ready you can see i got my gear on (laughs) i can hear you i love the glasses man it's very fernando tatis of you yeah, well, just so that you know I'm sincere, there's my eyes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wait, so Blair... I'm, uh, I'm putting the glasses back on because they're cool. Yeah, so wait, so so because we're doing this tomorrow, this Iron Man-ish, you, you, you're sitting on a bunch of like stuff in your garage that they delivered mm-hmm. yesterday. New helmet, yeah. new glasses. Is there like a team uniform yeah. and stuff or what? Oh, yeah, we got, you know, how our... Uh, our fans love us in spandex, so we got uh, – let me pull this out here. Scott, are you wearing <laughs> spandex tomorrow? Yeah, I'm going to rock some spandex. Nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, like it's a dumb question. Oh, yeah, we're rocking spandex, baby. Oh, look, look at Blair. Blair's got all the gear. Look at this. Mm-hmm. What's he, what do yeah. you got there? Is that a jacket? Mm-hmm. We got uh, – <laughs> <laughs> this is your spandex uh, cycling jersey. Uh huh. Says on the front, off the couch. On the back, because we can. Very nice. And uh, really, the the whole crux of the event there, the Iron Manish, one forty point six. Can I ask you guys a a question that that is stupid but still out of straight curiosity? How much Vaseline do you have to rub on your nipples to not chafe in one of those things? Mm, how much do you have? Because <laughs> I've seen the jokes. Is it real? It's real. How much do you have? Particularly <laughs> tomorrow for a couple of uh, completely washed up endurance athletes like Scott and I. Yeah, I mean, Blair, do you have, or how are you feeling today? Like I was telling the guys, I'm actually super excited. I've got like butterflies in my belly. Um, mm. And I don't know if it's because I'm like excited to do the race or I'm like petrified that I'm really not trained. I really have no business whatsoever attempting to go 140.6 miles tomorrow. And honestly, I've already prepared my mind for the suffering my body's going to have to do. But the intent is, and the goal is to just make it to the finish line tomorrow. Must finish. Super nervous. I'm with you, Scotty. I, I realize I'm perfectly unprepared for this physically. And so somewhere around noon or one o'clock, about halfway through our day, hopefully, um, I think is when the pain sets in. And that's, that's when the event and the challenge really begins. And, uh, well, I think the pain's going to be taken to a whole new level tomorrow for us <laughs> based on our lack of fitness. More, more nervous for tomorrow or more ne- nervous for this Catalina midnight swim that you did a couple years ago? Mm-hmm. Uh, scared for different reasons. Cause that was, you know, in the dark, uh, and I'd never done anything like it this time, uh, scared because, uh, well, I don't think either of us have ever ridden 133 miles and, uh, we did ride 70 miles last weekend and I'm still sore from that. So <laughs> As an early indicator of tomorrow's uh, game plan, uh, our, our race strategy is to start out slow and dial it back. Slow. Have you, have you ever gotten any injuries doing this? Absolutely. Yeah, injuries tomorrow are guaranteed. It's just going to be a question of whether they're permanent or not. Will Scott make the show on Monday or will he call out sick from pain? 
Uh, well, because he gets work out of his home studio, all he has to do is get down to the studio. But I, I guarantee he'll probably be walking backwards and very slowly. <laughs> also, Justin can just take the laptop upstairs. We don't really need you to be in that studio. Oh, yeah, that's right. You broadcast from bed on <laughs> from Monday. bed. This yeah, is perfect. <laughs> I know. And I, and I honestly, like I, I was planning the whole week next week. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll recover on Monday. And then ESPN called me and they're like, Hey, you're on on Monday night. Cause there's like this big Lakers celebration in the middle of the day. So I'm going to get done with the race on Saturday, try and rest and recover as best I can on Sunday. And then I'm going balls to the wall on Monday again. So Blair Cannon is here. He's in his garage. He's my neighbor. He lives around the corner. He's my training partner. He's one of my best pals in the world. We've raised a ton of money together for really worthwhile causes around San Diego. The, the Monarch School was one years ago we raised a lot of money for. Tomorrow, Blair, you put it out on Facebook and Instagram, and $20,000 came in like that. I put it out on Facebook, and I got like $1,500, which I'm extremely grateful for. Um, but I'd really love for people to, uh, to possibly support me in all of this or really support Challenge Athletes through our suffering. Yeah, man. I mean, you've, you've just crushed it, dude. People have come from all over the place to support you in this and support Challenge Athletes. It's, uh, yeah, I, was, I totally underestimated the uh, generosity in my uh, collection of friends here. So I, I had committed to matching their contributions, which has gotten a little uh, more than I anticipated, but it's all good. I got to <laughs> ask you, Scott, you know, yes, a 133 mile bike ride sounds crazy, but how about that swim? And what about the shark sightings a couple of weeks ago in that same area? So, you know, I'm panicked about this swim. Number one, um, I have gotten a wetsuit. I have gotten some, uh, darker goggles, hoping to not really see through much. Um, uh, I'd really love it if somebody would bring me some fins I'd like to use mm. a swim buoy. I'd like to use swimming paddles. I would like to use anything that gives me some sort of extra advantage. A kayak? And, listen, anything. I'm just, mm. yes, Blair, if I'm being oh. honest, like the, the one thing that I'm scared, you know what less about this swim. Yes. Um, I, I know the wetsuit's going to help you float and it's going to keep you warm. It's also, I just want you to think about this. It's also going to make you look a lot like a seal. <laughs> <laughs> and and that is you know i i like to say that you know humans aren't really on the menu for sharks but seals are and you're gonna look just like one tomorrow at 7 30 a.m which is i think feeding time feeding time in la jolla shores mm -hmm. so, blair are you uh blair you're not the one doing it in a pool right you're actually going to be there with scott yeah i'm gonna okay. uh i'll be holding his hand in the ocean here as we uh <laughs> Tee him up for a uh, buffet with the sharks. <laughs> I don't want to be. I don't want to do a memorial show on Monday. So can you uh, just get him ashore safely? What well, I don't care what condition, just get him ashore safely. Yeah, yeah, we'll bring him back. <clears throat> we'll no hopefully way, he'll yeah. have his limbs with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, man. I, I we 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 were joking about this like you know a month or two ago. Like, hey, this will be kind of fun and cool, and we'll do an Ironman kind of, and it'll be great. And we'll be like one big day of working out. And that was really fun, Blair, until today, <laughs> but it's tomorrow. It is. Um, well, I think it's going to be just fine. Uh, it just, you know, hopefully everybody can be patient and keep the lights on for us because, you know, we're going to start at 7.30 a.m., and who knows how the day is going to go, but, uh, you know, we might be out there at midnight still. Yeah. Yeah. They, they say guys that the race is 12 hours. Like you have 12 hours to complete it. And we've been doing the math and we kind of figure we got at least a nine hour bike ride in us on Saturday. You Wait know. a minute. So I'm supposed to meet you at the walking portion of this. That'll be a 10 PM. That'll be a 10 PM. Do you have any idea of what time I'm supposed to meet you? No. So should I just be on call? I'm not calling. No. You just got to be there. Where is the there? <laughs> what do you mean? I don't know. With the La Jolla Shores, we'll figure it out. I'll give you information later. Jeez Louise. Look, at Look for the uh, middle-aged uh, Jewish dude in spandex. You can't miss him. <laughs> <laughs> there'll, be, he, there'll be several of us <laughs> if, he, if, if you guys are all dressed, that, that dressed, like, right. dressed like seals in the dark it'll be difficult for me to see <laughs> well we're gonna do it man we're gonna do this thing hey Blair um, go back to work good luck That's, to you man yeah thanks buddy the helmet yeah. looks sharp the glasses look great 
Uh, glasses are awesome. I would love a pair of those glasses when, when y'all are. So would I. Yeah. They're bomb, aren't they? they hey, are. We're going to auction these off. If you guys make a donation to the cause. We'll auction them off to the top bidder. How's that? <laughs> Done. <laughs> so I'm, Game I'm worn goggles. I'm, I'm Game definitely goggles. not getting them. <laughs> we'll have scotty we'll have scott scotty's a celebrity so we'll have him sign them yeah right <laughs> hey blair great. wait real quick before you go did you say you're going to match the donations i did yes yes so so if you have if you raise twenty thousand dollars for cif you're going to add twenty thousand dollars uh well i already matched it so, oh, so okay, good. That, <laughs> okay yeah so hey hey stop it there i i'm i'm good in fact i've, I've been running into friends i'm like hey i'd like to support the cause i'm like oof you know, hey, I think we're good. I think we're good right now. Have you talked to Scotty? Go to Scott's page. Go to Scott's page, please. He needs that. My wife's going to kill me. Yeah. All right, Blair. I'll see you later today, man. All right. Cheers, guys. All right, buddy. Later. Bye. All right, guys, it's Beer Friday here on Kaplan and Crew. Now, listen, um, Alex, I, I, I'm very proud of this now that you have said to me that of all of my ideas, yeah, Beer Friday is my greatest idea of all time. I mean, to be fair to that, that statement, I'm very biased towards the beer community because I love beer so much. So that's a biased statement, but I still find it to be very true. Well, the I mean, thing was... Me personally, me personally, I think your best idea was to put me on the show. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing about this beer friday concept i had it years ago when we were on 1090 and i wanted to do it and every sales guy was like no you cannot put these brewers on the air for free and what i would say to them is it's great content because it it's what all guys would like to hear about and so we're not really giving it to them for free they're providing us with content so it's a, it's, a, it's a good relationship. Now the whole key to this is we need somebody who's going to become the sponsor of Beer Friday. You know what I mean? <laughs> we need a company that goes, yo, Beer Friday is brought to you by so-and-so. And that's what we need. And that's where we'll, we'll eventually we'll make a couple bucks off this deal. But Alex, why don't you, as our in-house beer expert or the closest thing we have, why don't you introduce us to the beer that we're about to try and the company we're about to meet and the gentleman that's about to join, yeah. Grande, take it away. Latchkey Brewing over in the old Mission Brewery building is joining us today. And this is co-founder Matt West. Matt, thanks for joining us, man. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Very cool, Matt. So, hey, so, so taking over that, that Mission Brewery building down by Petco Park, is that right? Uh, correct. Yeah, we've been there for a little over two and a half years. Wow. How'd that all happen? Um, you know, we were, you know, in the market looking to uh, start a brewery about, I don't know, three or four years ago, uh, my brother-in-law and I, so my brother-in-law, Gerald is the co-founder. Um, and he and I, like, we didn't have a whole lot in common. Um, we, you know, we married, uh, sisters, right? So <laughs> our, our wives are sisters and, you know, the holidays would come around and what have you. And uh, we didn't have a whole lot in common, but one thing that we did have in common was beer. And, um, you know, we, we always kind of, it started out as being a joke. Um, like at Christmas, I would get him the beers around the world box, and then we would drink together for, you know, for whatever, for days that we were hanging out together. And then over time, it almost became a competition where, you know, I lived up in Northern California and up in the Bay Area, and I'd be like, oh, I got this great new brewery down the road for me. Uh, this is back in like 2005, 2006. Um, and I would want to take him there. And then he's like, oh yeah, I got a great one down here. You got to come check out. And then next thing you know, fast forward five years, he's like, Hey, guess where I work now? I'm working at Ballast Point. And so like he put in a number of years there. And then uh, after they got bought, um, he actually was the first uh, employee hired to go over and be a distiller at Cutwater. Um, the original founders of Ballast Point went and started uh, Cutwater Distilling after that. So um, time went on and, and we really got serious about it and talked about wanting to open a brewery. So, um, you know, the beginning phases started during our business plan. And then out of nowhere, before we were ready, to be perfectly honest, this space opened up and it became available. And it's a, a really cool, unique building, um, challenging space. 
Um, you know, it's not only historical in terms of the building, but the brewery space in there is one of the first um, small breweries that was actually ever built in San Diego and has not been upgraded since then. So it is a 25 year old system. Um, it was it was put together in the 90s. So it's challenging from that perspective. But one of the things that we really wanted was, you know, how can we be unique aside from just the product, um, have kind of a cornerstone um, location that is, you know, iconic of San Diego beer. And it really is, it's, you know, the last or the oldest standing um, building that was, you know, originally built as a brewery uh, in Southern California right now. I didn't know that. I had no it idea. Built in, uh, 2010. Isn't it crazy how so many guys, Scott, that we've talked to are come from the Ballast Point family? Like there's so yeah, that, many guys. That was going to be my next question. It seems like, I mean, and obviously you're the person in the industry. You can answer this question better than any of us can. It seems like Ballast Point being bought kind of set the beer, the local beer industry here on fire in a lot of directions because it just kind of sent people out on their own ideas who didn't want to be into this huge machine type situation and wanted to be more of a personal level like they felt like ballast point was exactly and you know i have to say i'm the only one on our entire crew right now uh, management and ownership wise that actually didn't have a background in beer um anthony our head brewer um you know he was uh at ballast point with gerald um teresa who runs our tap room she also was at ballast point teresa's husband doug um, Palmonville was at, at Ballast Point. So it really is this, this community of people that came out of there. Um, and actually, I know that you guys had uh, Clayton from Epic on. Uh, was it last week or the week before? Um, Anthony and Clayton shared a brew deck for, for years, the 5 a.m. shift at Ballast Point. So we have, there is a lot of things that these breweries have in common. Um, and the one thing that I've seen um, sort of as an outsider looking at the Ballast Point business um, they kind of created a monster accidentally because, you know, talking to people in the industry, everybody talks about how it's an odd industry and, as it is in terms of how much of a community it is. Breweries supporting their competitors. Um, you know, it's like, hey, we're brewing today. Oh, damn, our grain shipment didn't come in. Anybody have this grain? Yeah, here, just, you know, get us back when your order comes in or whatever. You know, the industry really takes care of each other. But on top of it, Ballast Point in particular, they really took a lot of time and a lot of pride in training people and training people the right way. And Yusuf, um, who runs the or ran the brewery, brewing program at Ballast Point, you know, he is he teaches the um, the brewing program at UCSD as well. So you know, it's kind of in their DNA to not only bring on great brewers and a great team. It doesn't matter if they're brewers or if they're tap room people or if they're canning people. If they're going to learn a task. They learn it the right way. Their SOPs are so strong um, that everybody that comes out of that company is incredibly proficient. And in some ways, you know, the fact that they did sell and people started spinning off, it's like, all right, now you, you just created this incredibly competitive market space of <laughs> people know. that right. really know what they're doing. That's right. Well, hey, a, let me, go ahead. Real quick, let me just re reintroduce everybody. Uh, Matt West is here. He's the co-founder of Latchkey Brewing. And, and I just want to pick one thing up and then Alex, jump right back in. But yeah. Now, one thing you kind of left out in this story was, and it was really an interesting story. Me and my brother-in-law don't really get along that much. And, and the one thing we had in common was beer. And I, I knew the same experience when I was married. My brother-in-law and I, we did not have anything in common. The only thing we had in common was he played guitar and I sang. And, or tried to sing. Whoa, and, whoa, whoa. And, so, that's so a whole now, other interview, I like dude. A, I like how you tried to throw that you sing. Stop yeah, it. Yeah, well, I, I didn't know any words to any songs, but I hummed. So... So the thing is, is that I love the fact that beer brought you and your brother-in-law together. But yeah. the way you made it seem was he was here. He went to work for Ballast Point. You were in the Bay Area. You didn't tell us exactly what you were doing. And then you guys take over this Mission Brewery building. But there's, there's, some, there's some holes I just want to get to real quick. Just, how'd you guys do it? I mean, did, did somebody come up with a batch in their garage? Where'd the money come from? I don't know. Maybe you were up in, in Silicon Valley and you made a bunch of money and you decided to put it into beer. Can you just fill in the blank there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is a big hole in the story. So yeah, I was up there working in Silicon Valley. Um, I am, you know, a 20-year marketing veteran, um, working primarily in both advertising as well as in, uh, in technology, uh, directly in-house. Um, and in, what was it, 2010 or so, um, my job was sending me all over the world 
And while the money was good, um, it was just, it, it kind of burned me out. And I decided that that career was not going to be, you know, I was not going to be long for that career uh, for much longer. So that's when we really started thinking about, you know, what, what can we do that's more local? Um, being a, a marketer, you know, I'm one step removed from earning an honest living, honestly. <laughs> and then being in technology are also kind of one step removed from making a good old honest living. And there's so many jobs out there, whether it's owning like a small neighborhood shop or if it's a plumber, no matter what those people touch, that is a very tangible product that they build. And when I say making a good, honest living, I mean, like, honestly, every single thing that you do, you see the outcome of that product. When you're working in marketing, it's, there's, you know, a lot of theory. There's a lot of analytics. There's a lot of, you know, making stuff work and hoping it works. And it's a very, very important piece of the business, but being on the side of it that you're, you know, once you spend 20 years doing it, you really do have a hard time looking at something going, I got my hands dirty, I built something and there it is. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just, it is a little bit less tangible and I miss the days I used to, so another hole in the story is before I started in that career after um, school, I had actually gone to culinary school and I was a chef and I loved that. And I actually really missed that component of creating and, and delivering product to people. So where the, so who, who started the business and where'd the money come from? Was so yeah, friends Gerald and family? I, Did you raise a hundred grand. I mean, how'd you do it? Yeah. So, um, we did both. So I put down the lion's share of the seed money and then we reached out to friends and family and just raised money that way. Um, we're fortunate to know some people that, um, our CFO is a good friend of mine, actually. He, uh, is a chief operating officer for a hedge fund. So he knows a lot of people that want to invest in things, but really on a small level. So like we're talking tens of thousands of dollars at a time that we're raising amongst friends and family, uh, on top of the, the money that we put in ourselves. And primarily that was my wife and I that put that money down. So it's one oh. thing when you're starting uh, starting a business is, is one thing, right? But the product is a whole other thing. So exactly. who came, because you can't have a brewery unless you have a recipe to make beer. And we all know <laughs> Ballast Point survives off scope and basically alone. So did you come up with the recipe? Did your brother-in-law come up with the recipe? And what was that beer that you're like, this is it. We can start a brewery because of this beer. Exactly. So we did do a lot of that. And then what became very clear is that the, just the two of us, we had to figure out if we're going to scale a business, how, which directions are we going to scale it? Are we going to be in the brewery making beer every day? Are we going to take the skills that we know really well and, and really enhance those? So really where we ended, ended was Gerald had a lot of connections in the industry and he goes, you know what? Well, well we've made some good home brews. Um, we know what we're doing. We can go and scale this stuff up. We made that hard decision to say, we need to go and get a head brewer. And that's when Gerald reached out to Anthony, um, Anthony Beach, who you know, uh, he's an incredible brewer. He was a specialty brewer at uh, Ballast Point. And really his job was um, working alongside people like Nate from, from Epic um, and those guys that came up with recipes and then scaling them up um, to, to, you know, full market size. And so he was really good at, you know, like he is an absolute nerd when it comes to beer. Mm -hmm. And so he just came up, sorry. Um, he came up as like the guy that we needed to go after and timing happened to be perfect um, with the acquisition um, having just gone through and some changes were happening in the business and we were able to reach out to him and um, you know, we brought him in, gave him equity in the company and he is a partner in the company. So listening to you talk about your career, it's, it's really interesting because you, the thing, everything you mentioned, it has to do with creating something. And I really Correct. feel like people who follow their passion, regardless of what the field is, the underlying ability to be able to create something and then watch it come to life is very important. But part of that also is knowing when to let something go. How do, how do you tell people when is it time? When do you know when is it time to not do this and do and go in this direction as opposed to that direction? That's actually a really good segue into something I wanted to touch on today is, um, you know, when we first started as a, a business, we really wanted to have the model, a high margin model of, you know, all, not necessarily just a book 
boutique brewery because we do want distribution, but we wanted the lion's share of our business to be done out of our tap rooms. Um, and then, you know, once we get our first tap room stable and, and strong, open another one and then another one and have, you know, five or six tap rooms um, within a hundred miles and make it just become, you know, a well-known local brand was really our goal. And as we got into COVID um, with these shutdowns, that blew up that entire plan. And while we had always, you know, planned to, to do packaged beer, it really gave us a kick in the ass and said, you know, it's time to, it's really time to do it. Um, there was a point where we call it our lemonade stand, where during the shutdown, we were still allowed to sell beer out of the tap room, but we literally set it up at a window with a table and <laughs> people would, you know, order their, their cans online or their crawlers online and come over and pick them up. And, you know, it was great. The industry rallied around us. Our numbers were actually pretty solid during the first couple of months. Uh, but we realized because of that, that the, um, you know, the, as this kind of dragged on, and it wasn't something that was going to happen for six weeks or eight weeks, um, it was time to start packaging. So we actually pivoted our business. We're not giving up on our tap room, but we're definitely giving up on the tap room being our primary means of revenue. So we decided that we're going to uh, start packaging beer. We've now packaged off four of our beers. Um, and we've been moving in. We started in small local bottle shops. Um, we launched an e-commerce website that was originally just for merch. And now we actually have it. So we're, we're shipping beer all throughout California now. Um, and then now we're, we're sort of staring at, um, you know, local grocery chains um, as perhaps our, our next step. Um, and you know, if the days come that the tap room is the, the primary source of income again, we'll do it. But to your question, you know, a lot of times you need to stop and let the, uh, you know, let the market really tell you when it's time to make that, that pivot and make that change. Well, we have some cans know, in front I, of I us. Know, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let, let's, let's try this beer. Uh, Matt West is here. Alex, make sure, uh, just making sure our, our Zoom is going well. Everything yes. cool, smooth. Okay. Any um, relation to Adam West? I wish. <laughs> what about Kanye West? Definitely. No. Yeah. Nice. Definitely <laughs> don't wish on that one, huh? Uh, Matt, Matt West is the co-founder of Latchkey Brewing. We're about to try his beer. For those of you that are listening on radio on 1090, or for those of you that are watching on YouTube or Facebook, or you're listening on any of the audio pa podcast platforms, the first thing I can tell you is I really love the packaging. So looking forward to trying this beer. Um, great stories, Matt. I, I'm just real quick as we, before we taste, are you the beer guy or are you the marketing guy? Cause it sounds to me like you got to have a great marketing guy and you got to have somebody that makes great beer. You've already talked to us about yeah. finding a beer man. So it sounds like you're using all your skills and all your background to, uh, to bring to the table. Yeah. It's funny. Like, so Gerald's also a very creative person. You know, he was big into music and, and art and stuff like that uh, prior to his career in beer. But, um, but yeah, you know, when we set up the business, we kind of did take that approach where, you know, he's beer and, and production and everything that goes around production and operations on that side, including the, the brewing side of the business. Um, and I'm, you know, I've been more of the marketing sales, um, administrative legal HR <laughs> kind of uh, side of things. Um, but as time went on, it does actually settle in the middle where we both actually do a lot of the, uh, you know, collaborate on a lot of the creative stuff. So for instance, the can art, um, which I'll hold up one right here. All right, let's um, take a taste of our first beer. The, the first one that you're holding up is yeah. called Fogger. And yeah. um, it's funny because what I think of when I see this, this can is I think of the old video game Frogger. You got it. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Yeah. A lot of our names, our naming conventions are, you know, being latchkey kids, throwbacks to the uh, 80s and 90s, um, whether it's music, movie, video game references. Um, but yeah. All right. So this That's is, this is, which one, this is. Y'all going to make a paper boy? <laughs> oh, we should. That would be great. That would be a good one. Paper boy is probably the most underrated game of all time. 
You know what it was? It was the Tony Hawk Pro Skater before Tony Hawk Pro Skater existed. Yes. <laughs> mm. I mean, now UPS mm. would probably sue you if you made if you made Paperboy now. Or tell, exactly. tell us about tell us about the latchkey Fogger Foggy Pilsner. Okay, so you notice? I'm glad you poured that into a glass. It's not super foggy, but it's just foggy enough. We mm -hmm. we're not going to call it a hazy. That would not be a very good beer. A a, uh, a hazy Pilsner, but we did want to do definitely a um, almost like a Zwickel beer style. Uh, where it's a little bit hazy um, and a little bit hoppy. So that's kind of where, if you look at the artwork on the can, we're trying to convey both. It's foggy and it's hoppy. Um, <laughs> but not too hoppy. That's, that's really funny. Now that I see that it's, it's, I see the fogginess to the can. That's really funny. Exactly. And then if you look on the back, what we're actually really proud of, if you look at the second logo on the bottom, is uh, Pizza Port. This was actually a uh, collaboration that we did with the guys up at Pizza Port in Carlsbad. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. That's so this good. is right uh, up your of, this is right up your alley, Scott. Yeah, the Fogger, uh, the Foggy Pilsner. Yeah, I'm I'm like not an IPA or a hazy IPA. I'm I'm more I like lighter. Um, so so what I like about this beer is it's it's light as you point out the color, but yet yeah. it is kind of foggy. Um, so it's it's not like too big and heavy. And it's not too small and weak, you know? Exactly. Exactly. We call it our uh, a modern take on a lawnmower beer. So virtually your your all day drinker, hang out in the yard or or a baseball beer. So if you if you like the flavor of a hoppy beer, but you don't like the bitterness and the the aggressiveness, this will give you those nice citrusy pine notes um, without having to, you know, be a seven percent IPA. It's it's only five point two percent and super easy drinking. Super yeah, easy. Nice. So Super easy. this is the lawnmower beer or baseball beer. Hmm? What's the nightclub beer? Oh, man. <laughs> you want to move on to that one? Yeah, let's yeah. move on to another beer. We got three of them. Yep. Your uh, nightclub beer, the Dreamer IPA. This was, this is actually a beer that we're incredibly proud of. Um, it's not necessarily the most responsible margin wise, this beer. Um, and I will say that only because, um, we packed this beer with hops. Um, it's got five different hops. It's got, <laughs> it, it really showcases Strata up front, Citra, Mosaic, uh, Simcoe, and a little bit of Eureka hops in the end. So the, the Strata and the, the Citra are what give you the nice fruity notes. Um, and that Eureka gives you that kind of dank note. It actually almost <laughs> smells like a bag of weed. Uh, <laughs> oh my god i swear to you did i just put my nose in here and i went i went like this i went ooh, like like it does it smells like a bag of weed <laughs> i got five on it <laughs> speaking of which have you ever thought before sorry to cut you off on this beer have you ever thought about collaborating with like a dispensary and making some sort of uh like like us we're sponsored by tori holistics would you ever think about partnering with the tori holistics and making some sort of uh cbd beer Absolutely. Um, it's funny. We were just talking about that the other day, like CBD, I think we can get away with. I'm not sure we'd have to look at the legalities around it. Um, I know there are some of the bigger breweries out there that are launching lines of, uh, THC beers. Um, Dude. Dude, I, I got, I, I got these buddies of mine. I'll introduce you to them. They, uh, there are going to be a new sponsor of the show starting next week. They're called the Hellman Valley growing company. Uh, -huh. uh these guys are all former Marines that used to belong to something called the Hellman Valley gun company or something. They've all got these tats on their arms and stuff. And they, they're a bunch of Marines who are now into the THC business, uh -huh. um, who are um, raising, they take all the profits and they put it towards this uh, foundation where they're trying to get, you know, military people off opiates and stuff. So I don't know, it could be an interesting connection for you guys. That is absolutely a, a killer idea. Yeah. yeah these guys send are, that information on. I will. We're going to have to have an off air conversation. Okay. So, so this, this is really is, good though. See, the, this is the kind of stuff that I drink. You know, like Scott, <laughs> like Scott loves, I mean, this is super good too. I've actually never had this one. I've had this one before. This Wait, is so really you good. like, you like the fogger, the foggy Pilsner, but yes. you're more of a, you like the dreamer, the IPA. Like you said, this is a nightclub beer. Like this is the kind of beer when I want to drink beer, this is the kind of beer that, that I go for. Like I want to, I want to taste it. I want to smell it. Like I know I'm drinking beer right here. Now, yeah. For me, I like the fogger <laughs> a lot better. So I, one thing I would love to, to cover on that too is, uh, Alex mentioned that, that while he likes bigger, hoppier beers, um, the rest of you guys like not as much. Um, but I deliberately wanted to send that over 
just for the reason of, you know, beer actually can be broken down into, um, you know, raw materials, um, recipes, and also process. Like process is such a big part of, of how your beer comes out. And one of the big things that we do is the way that we dry hop our IPAs and the way that we bitter hop our IPAs, you'll notice that while it has a ton of hops and just like, it just fills your palate with all the different hop components. Yeah. It doesn't give you that residual bitterness that you get out of most IPAs. That's um, true. And, you don't really and, feel it here at all. There's no exactly. like residual and the effect. for that is, is time and temperature in terms of uh, when we do the, the bitter hopping on this. So a little bit goes into the boil in terms of, of getting a, a little bit of bitterness out. But most of our hop side hops, we actually do at like 170, 180 degrees in a whirlpool instead of bittering it. And, you know, if you think about it in terms of making tea, if you were to take a tea bag and put it in boiling water, it's going to extract all of those tannins out and all of the, the sharp, bitter components of that tea. Um, and you do that deliberately when making beer but you do it with a small amount in order to just give you a little bit of a bitter bite, even down to your domestics, like your Budweiser's and your Coors. They all have that. A lot of the, the Pilsner's have it, but it's on such a small level that you get a bitter bite, but it's not overwhelming. You see that Scott? Hey, yep. All this that's, stuff that, all the stuff that goes into making a beer and you just crack it up. And you're like, Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. Wait, let me just say, Hey Matt, we're talking about Matt West. He's the co-founder of Latchkey Brewing. Hey Matt, we're running really short on time here. So tell us sure. about the third beer, the Doppeldacker, the Doppelbach. Can you tell us about this one? Yeah. So that name is deliberately a typo. Um, <laughs> the, the name of that, we had a bunch of uh, German military guys in the brewery. Um, they were here for a couple of weeks just as we were launching that beer and, um, we were like, they love the beer. And we're like, all right. So after a, a lot of drinking of it, we're like, all right, fine. You guys need to name it. So they named it Doppeldacker, which is not even a real word in German. It's actually <laughs> Doppeldecker, which means biplane, like double decker. But he's like, I'm going to give you Doppeldecker, but I'm going to put an A with an umlaut in there just so you can have an umlaut in the name. <laughs> <laughs> so while it's a dark beer, it's nice and soft. Mm. Um, it's not bitter at all. Oh, see, you see, like that, Scott? Okay, see, you like that, Scott? Okay, so, so my natural inclination, Matt, is to not even really want to try a dark beer. I don't like Guinness. I don't like anything that looks like motor oil. Okay, um, this my my first taste. I was like, ooh, that's actually really good. There's, check me on this, but there's a little bit of a sweetness to it. It's a perceived sweetness. So. There's, uh, there's a, um, a grain that we use in there. It's called Simpson's chocolate malt and it's a barley that's just roasted in a way that when it roasts to its, its dark state, it actually gives off this, this flavor and this aroma of chocolate. So it, the, the sweetness isn't necessarily there, but the perception of sweetness because it smells like chocolate fills your palate with that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's nice and soft and easy drinking. Brown, um, what do you think? Oh, I love that beer. If I was ever going to make a beer and call it Brown Man, this would be it. <laughs> <laughs> Grande, what do you think about this? Yeah, I love it. I've had, actually have bought a, I've bought a four pack of this before. I've had plenty of this one. Um, as Matt knows, like I hang out with some from mutual friends and this is a, a, a latchkey favorite. All right. This yeah. is my, my favorite beer. This is my, my winner today. <laughs> I did not will. expect that. I really I thought you would go with Dude, Fogger. I, I know. It. This I'm might always be up for the challenge. When somebody says I don't like something, I always give them something that's what they say they don't like. This um, might be my favorite beer we've had the entire time we've been doing this. Really? Nice. Yes. Yes. Cause that's, I, that's some, uh, some big competition out there. It yeah. rolls, um, it's smooth, but it's also tasty. Yeah. That's what I hope that people, because I know these two guys are getting it because they're drinking them, but this is what the whole point of this to me was everybody thinks they like a certain type of beer. But there's so many different types of beers out there that you wouldn't even give a chance to until you actually try them. And that's what this segment is providing. Problem is, no, no, but here, and, and Matt, before you go, here's the issue with that, Alex. The Too issue is, the issue is, right, I go to a place, they've got all these beers listed, and I get confused, and I, and I don't know, what do I like? So then, once I find out that I like lager, then it's just easy for me to order lager. You know, yep. now, if I were to see Doppeldacker, on a menu somewhere, I'd be like, ooh, can you pour me one of those? Because this is, I mean, it's smooth. 
it's not too heavy and it has a sweetness to it that I really like. Yeah. Believe it or not, it's a, it's designed for barbecue, like designed perfectly to go with meat. You would think it's more of like cold winter night, but yeah. no hot day in the summer, like a shiner bock, um, you know, a hot day in the summer with barbecue. That's it's, it's great. Oh with- dude, you put this with some sweet ribs. Oh yeah. You know, this is a, this is my favorite bit we've done so far. Got to admit. That's awesome. Yeah. And hats, look at that hats, smile on his face. Hats yeah. off to you. Hats <laughs> off to you, Lashley. You, you just want to, you just want a customer. Matt. I my day. Matt, do you understand we've had three sips of your beer and we're all drunk already? Oh, you Whoa, guys. Slow are. down. You guys. Slow you down. are, dude. Slow down. You slow are. Down. Slow down. All right. Slow down. Maybe I am. Hey, uh, Latchkey Brewing Company. Matt, um, I'm going to tell everybody to visit your website, latchkeybrewing.com. And you're all open. Right. What's right. that? You're open, right? We are open. Um, Thursday through Sunday, our tap room is open. And then you can find our beer throughout town. Dude, cheers. Have a great weekend. Thank cheers, you man. very much for all of the beers and the trying and the education. Matt, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, buddy. All right, guys, we're wrapping things up here on the podcast. Can I just tell you guys one thing really strange? I mean, I know we're celebrating and it's Friday and it's Beer Friday. And thank you to all of our great sponsors, Corky's and Total Tea and Mountain Trust and Tory Holistics and Seven Mile Casino. Thank you guys all very much. Um, I know we're celebrating on a Friday. Did you, guys, did you guys see the movie yet, The Social Dilemma, that I've talked about a little bit? No. no. Okay, so one of the things they talk about is kids today – and how they are um, like young kids at 16. I don't know about you guys. The day I turned 16, I was at the DMV getting my driver's license. Got my li- driver's license on my 16th birthday. Got my driver's license at 18 years old. Well, they, they talk about how kids today don't want their driver's licenses. And it's mostly because they're been addicted driving to driving since I was 13. But, but anyway, here's my point. They also talked in this movie about how, how we talk the social dilemma, social media, right? And teen suicide. Guys, I'm going to tell you a crazy story really quick before we get off the air. In the last two months, I have watched two young people here in my community. Somehow, kids that seemed really good just end their own lives. I mean, I don't know what else to say, man. I mean, it's a scary, scary time. This COVID thing, I have so underestimated what it has done to kids. To mental health. I know my son is here. My, you guys know my boy, Justin, come, Justin, come on in here a second. You guys got to hear this crazy story. I'll end it. I'll make the, the end of the podcast quick, but dude, we had a kid that we coached as a high school or as a little kid, baseball, flag football, kid goes to San Diego state. And yesterday we all find out that he, this young man took his own life. Can you believe, is that crazy? Like, listen, whoever you are out there, whatever's bothering you, whatever's upsetting you, whatever has got you fucked up in the head, dude, there's help out there. There is help out there for you. So do we know anything about, here's my son, Justin. Do we know anything about this? I don't know if that's like the accurate story. So I don't want that to like be the the right story, but it is just crazy because I mean, I played little league pop Warner with this kid. I was like really, really good friends with him until probably high school and like all of us just talking now it's just like whoa like this is like everyone's like first real death that we've kind of been associated with that's crazy he played high school lacrosse at tory pines like the best high school lacrosse program in the county you guys just find out right now and he was in a fraternity there He's in a fraternity at san diego state did we just find out like just this minute no like within the last like you know i don't know 24 hours yeah they raised over $28,000 in less than 48 hours. Isn't that crazy, dude? I mean, what the hell, man? I think in a time like this, we all need to always understand that you don't know what another person is going through. And it's probably best that we all are a little more cautious with each other and more open to communicate with each other. Sometimes asking a person, how are you, could mean way more than you ever thought it could in a time like this. So I always tell people, you don't know what a person is going through, so never judge a person by a single action that they've done. It's Always- also important not to be a total asshole like Skip Bayless and make fun of someone that's going through fucking mental health issues. Like, right. as famous as you are, it's okay. You know what I mean? Like, don't like it's not 1975 anymore. You can talk about these things. You should talk about these things, and you, there shouldn't be a stigma around having issues with those things. So. <sighs> That's how you end. That's how you end. And have a good weekend. See you tomorrow. (laughs) 
Sorry about Monday. that. That was the Monday. Hey, hey, listen, we'll see no. you on Monday. If we anybody see got... him tomorrow for the for watch him cripple himself. Yeah. Hey, listen, uh, let's make sure that I will send you guys all the logistics. And uh, for everybody nice. that's watching, dude, um, I will say this. I'm going to do a bunch of Instagram live tomorrow. So if you want to keep up with what we're doing, I'll bring my uh, I'll bring my stick, my uh, selfie stick. And I'll... Good. All right. Listen, have a great weekend. Uh, enjoyed it. Cheers to everybody. Much love. We'll see you guys on Monday. Be safe.